This is the Build OGM call for February 22nd, uh, 2022. We were just talking about, um, actually maybe uh, Judy, I'll let you, you take over and resummarize what you just said. Well, in, good morning, everybody. Um, I was talking about the dimensions of OGM. And in my mind, there perhaps are three, the third one triggered by Stacy's comment, but one is the actual knowledge content the facts and connections and background and so forth that has been the tradition of OGM as it was organized. Um, a second area is the social connectivity dimension in terms of what groups are working on what aspects of OGM and how might they connect with one another. And a third one that Stacy named today was philosophy, which is sort of a deep dive into what we would want the I don't know, the full philosophic content level to be about dimensions of OGM. And I think if we were to look at it as that triad it would be really interesting because we could look at where we are shaping or pursuing philosophy. And then that would lead to the connective social groups and other groups that wanna pursue a certain dimension. So that's an attempt at a recap. <laughs> Thanks, that's a good one. Um, it's it's funny. So I see it. I see it. I feel like I see it differently. Okay. <laughs> well, that's that's um, good. That's maybe there's four or five of those. <laughs> well, I, I, uh, I to to me, <clears throat> when I look at uh, what OGM does, it's it's mostly about philosophy. Um, OGM has a hard time collecting content. Um, so as you know, I, I'm near and dear to my heart is wikis and things like that, uh, knowledge bases. Um, OGM has a really hard time concentrating and keeping a knowledge base. So we had, you know, we we kind of started the, the OGM wiki. It was mostly me and Jerry. Um, uh, it got big, but nobody ever used it. Um, we had OGM forum, uh, which was a place where content was actually kind of starting to form and collect. And we couldn't keep focus on it, and and you know we've stopped using it. Uh, so, what what I see us doing a lot is talking philosophy. We like to get meta. We like to you know on a Thursday call, it's we 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 bring up little bits of content, but we never weave them together into an archive. We always like just like to free associate on them and and dream and you know yep. and talk about that. So. So I would put philosophy is the thing that we do. And then connection is kind of the next thing that happens because of that. We've made a lot of connections in OGM. And that's one of the, the best things about OGM for me is meeting all the people that I've met and hanging out with them and, and doing stuff like that. And then content for me is, is the, uh, the poorest stepchild um, who gets no, no love, basically. Um, even though we, we want to think that we're all about content. And Jerry... You know, another another huge reservoir of knowledge, uh, a knowledge base. Um, Jerry can kind of put stuff in there, and um, free Jerry's brain, by the way. Bentley and me and Mark Antoine and and Jerry and other folks are working on making Jerry's brain more accessible. But but again, it's kind of like content that's not accessible right now. You know, so it's, it's interesting. <laughs> So I, I agree with everything that's been said. And Pete, that's why when I was talking yesterday about, I, I used the word basic. I don't mean basic. I just meant going back to the very beginning and mapping it out. I think you would get more of those same philosophical participants adding to the content once you identified what their real passion was. And I think that's where you know, that's sort of like where you find out who everybody is. I, I so wish that to be true. And I have a really <laughs> hard time believing it right now. <laughs> um, especially the, the OGM well, forum experience was, was pretty, I mean, you know, we, we had, we had lots of kind of through lines. What are we interested in? What are we talking about? What's the, you know, what are the core parts of, around which we would build content, right? And it's really hard for the, this group to keep focus and build a knowledge base. Um, we, we get too distracted by, we get overly distracted by, you know, let's, let's talk about the philosophy of why we're, um, you know, collecting the philosophies. Why, let's talk about the philosophy of why we're collecting content. Um, what's our philosophy about, you know, getting together and doing stuff. So, um, I, I would love to see that happen, Stacey. And 
<laughs> I've got PTSD at this point. I, the, the forum is one way that we started doing that, right? But it's it's one of a number of ways where you know we don't we don't knowledge very well. We just don't. I think that's a valid concern, P, because it it is so amorphous and so all inclusive that it, it reminds me of the old elephant joke. What do you think the elephant is? It depends on what part you grab. Um, yeah. <laughs> and to some extent, that's how those of us that use Jerry's brain, I use it more in the content mode than in the philosophy mode because it just leads me to other sources. Um, but I think the, the interesting dimension, I, I think where my energies have channeled lately is that I'm interested in how to influence open-minded constructive thinking and change in a world that seems increasingly unstable. And that's gonna require touching almost all these topics. There's the mechanics of how you do things. There's the philosophy behind why you wanna do things. You know, and so um, that's a, a really complex thing to unsnarl. Yep. But if, if we could do it, the utility would be immense. And yep. my sense would be that from my personal experience, if you want to try something, pick a small corner and see if you can do a model in that small corner yep. that works. And then you can see, you'll, you'll debug it some and you can roll it out to a broader dimension of people and they'll develop their corner. <laughs> yep. um, I, I wonder, I, I'm... I'm called to drag us in a little bit different direction um, and maybe to catch you up a little bit, Judy. Um, there's some interesting stuff that's going on that's kind of at the periphery of what we think of as OGM that's still, I think, very OGM-y and, um, uh, and is about getting something done. Uh, so, um, uh, so two big things that are going on right now. Um, one of them is... Uh, some some really amazing activity around Wendy Alford. Uh, so I'm pretty much her main link. I'm, I'm almost her only link to OGM um, uh, because of her time zone, oddly enough. <laughs> uh, she She's up, her, her early morning is about noon our time, my uh, Pacific time. Um, so she misses out on, she's, you know, fast asleep uh, on the traditional uh, OGM morning calls. Uh, so, it's kind of like she lives she lives in a different part of the world or something like that. It, but the the time zone is actually like a geographical distance thing. Um, however, uh, she's kind of ended up in the nexus of this really interesting set of conversations around um, indigenous thinking. Um, it started with water rights in Australia, um, and um, it's sucking her further and further into. Um, uh, uh, Tyson, and I forget his last name, the guy who wrote Sand Talk, um, uh, is somebody that she's now talking with. She's also talking with Anne Polina, uh, another indigenous leader in Australia. Um, and so it's, it's interesting, some of the things that, that OGM has been talking about on the mailing list, actually, uh, you know, um, uh, coming back to place, uh, soil and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the idea of I guess the, uh, there's an idea of remembering indigenous science and indigenous wisdom, right? Um, right. And that's, it's a, it's a big thing that I'm kind of hoping that I can bump m more of Wendy into more of OGM. Uh, I think there's a lot of productive conversation there. Separately, another thing that's going on, Jordan is still uh, on his project. Um, it's now called the Meta Project. Um, right. And he's... Uh, he's moving to convene uh, a number of people and, and, you know, it's still kind of the same mission, uh, but it feels like it's getting a little more, a little more concrete uh, where he and I have talked about uh, tools and processes and things like that. And he's talked with a lot of people about a lot of stuff. Um, Stacey, I think you might want to, might want to catch us up a little bit on that. Um, and then completely separately from that, but it feels like the same thing. Um, uh, 
there's a, a small group of us uh, spearheaded by David Boval who have a, a, a cool art project coming out this afternoon, um, which, uh, which will be a surprise. Um, it's a cool little art project, um, uh, but, um, but it, it feels again aligned with kind of this connecting, you know, the, the, the fractals are getting bigger, um, not just with OGM, but around OGM too. So that was what I wanted to say. I've had some connections with Jordan around the Meta Project. Um, and it's still, in my mind, it's, it's very large in scope and needs definition and concrete starts yep. to figure out. I mean, I think we're talking about how do you engineer social change in an effective way? Yep. And that's something that lots of folks have been examining for centuries. And so we need to be very thoughtful and, and do some um, differentiating experiments if, if I can use science language, because I think depending on how we do it, uh, creating more energy and action if it's not channeled in an effective way isn't going to be as helpful as we would want it to be. Yep. Yeah, and um, uh, Jordan's, because he has like planetary scope, um, uh, he needs to set up self-replicating systems basically um, mm -hmm. and decentralized, you know, coordinated decentralized efforts and things like that. So getting the initial conditions right is really important. It would also seem to me that it would be highly desirable, if possible, to build some level of experimental modeling into that so that we can actually determine which approaches are more effective than other approaches and for what reasons. Um, it isn't yeah. just a dendritic expansion process, because yeah. if you're expanding in multiple dimensions and multiple topic zones and multiple geographies and social conditions, the complexity factor is so high. Yeah. That making any way replicable or a learning process gets hard. Yeah, I kind of uh, he and I have have had some discussions about. So, so from my point of view, uh, something that that scales that big uh, can't have a, a singular kind of pattern to it. It has to be um, something yeah. that. Um, uh, you have to have lots of little nodes, and then the little right. nodes act have to act more or less independently. Exactly. Uh, so you need to have um, uh, you need to have ways com like uh, commonly agreed on on ways of kind of communicating. You know what you need, what you have, those kinds of things across across the network. But mm -hmm. then each of those. So so you want to specify like the in inputs and outputs and how to make agreements with each other. You don't want to specify in a hard way. You know, this is the way that you have to do it. Um, exactly. You should you should say everyone's free to kind of figure out the right way to do it as long as you can talk to to everybody else, right? So then, as an outcome of that, you'll end up having experiments. You know, one group will be using uh, one tech stack, another group may not be using technology at all, um, and you'll get to see um, just because there's there's going to be lots of decentralized nodes working together it'll it'll act like uh experiments basically so that sounds good pete so so, so then you actually you, you the thing on top of that is you do need a way to figure out or to to track and evaluate what's going on right so back to kind of dashboards and and reporting well, and, and, and it's like also that. i mean my experience is that when you cross populate communities there are some really powerful learnings because community A did it different than community B mm -hmm. and each had certain strengths. And if you pull those attributes, they'll choose to pull in one or more of those attributes in different ways. Right. And that's the richness of the diversity of participation. Yeah. It's also the challenge of how to document in any way that's useful for other people. Yeah. Um, and so that's-, that's Back, a, back that's to a that knowledge but, content. Yeah, that gets that's that's a combination of knowledge content and behavioral content in terms of, you know, classically, you know, this will work in group A, 
but it won't work in group B, but this would work in group B right. because of the different collection of people and the different approaches that they're accustomed to taking. Yep. So. Stacey, you were gonna say something? Yeah, I was gonna say that to both of your points, that's why I thought before anything formal happened that in a small group where we already have those agreements implied, like we already know how we react with each other and where we're thinking that we view that podcast that came out with and um, that Anna Smithson and Jean Houston did with Mariana Bosan, because I thought that was the perfect one to meet this goal of um, just seeing where everybody is. I can't put it into words, but I just thought that was the starting place to before the starting place. Uh, thanks, Stacy. Let me find the link. And unless you want to grab the link and yeah, if you could put I that in, I was just going to send one of you a text to see. I reference. will. It will take me a while. I'll. I'll get it. That's okay. I'll figure it out. Um, I've got it, Stacy, and oh, thank and you. Post it, but um, if only there were like a bookmarking system where we could keep track of. No, if only I could figure out how to split my screen and not keep losing Fair enough. part of you. And I've been working on it for a day. Well, you could throw it in the chat. That's one way to do it. No, I can't. I can't no. access it. Does have enough windows? Else. Yes. I'm sorry. Michael, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, Michael. <laughs> um, I was going to say um, regarding the, the meta project, um, I'm just catching up on a lot of uh, what was, I was, I was off the uh, email chain for a while. And then Stacy, I think you were the one to put me back on. So I appreciate that. Yeah. And so there was a lot I missed and I'm catching up on. And I saw your post about the video, which I haven't seen yet. Um, but that all sounds really interesting. One question that I feel like I can ask in this group um, that, I feel like speaking of elephants is, is an elephant in the room is for a lot of people, the, the personalization inherent in the idea that Jordan's running for president um, is a concern, you know, that the idea that, I, th I think in this space, um, you know, we, we do well when things are not too personified and, you know, oh, here's, you know, here's Tim Berners-Lee, Tim Berners-Lee's thing. And, you know, there's this one's thing and that one's thing. And which are you going to pledge allegiance to? Um, but at the same time, obviously you need people to be motivators and, and publicizers. And uh, I'm just wondering how, you know, what thoughts people have and how we go about building something that feels, um, that feels like you, you aren't signing a pledge of allegiance to one thing. And, and, and you know, maybe it's not possible just the same way that, you know, if you're a crypto enthusiast, oh, you're like putting everything down on crypto and that's not because Satoshi was a person who you were getting behind because it's just somebody who wrote a white paper. But um, anyway, I'm throwing that out there as a question to hear people's thoughts on. <laughs> I have another question to add to that. Are the two, I didn't take it that the two had to be connected. I took it as Jordan's doing this regardless of what happens. And here's the meta project if anybody's interested. And if I'm wrong, that's the way I think it should be. So I'll say that on the record. <laughs> I, sure, don't, I, don't, oh. I don't see political initiatives connected to collective persona per se. I mean, I think they're fairly independent and individuals need to do what they think they can do to be most effective. Um, so I think I'm reinforcing what you're saying, Stacey. Yeah. 
but it's been a, a few weeks since I've talked to, to Jordan about the meta project. I mean, we had some extensive calls a month or so ago that I haven't connected recently. Did you, did you happen to talk to him about running for president? No, not directly. I, I mean, it was in content, but I, I kind of chose not to pull that string at that moment. <laughs> it's, it's an interesting string, yes. I, from from my point of view, I think it's a good question, Michael. And I, I, you know, it's it's something that you kind of need Jordan in the room to talk talk through more. The the uh, the thing for me is that uh, the American political process and then uh, the American presidency is kind of fraught with uh, lots of distraction and lots of interconnection with business and you know capitalistic it's, it's, networks. It's very like, yeah, it's a complicated thing, and I. I don't know if I wanted to be a change agent, I think I'd try to be more like Thich Nhat Hanh than I would be a president. <laughs> but, you know, but uh, I, Jordan's obviously called, you know, it's Jordan fun. has a strong calling and a, and a strong, um, you know, a, a, he's a strong person. So maybe that's the right thing for him. It might be, and it could be very helpful. <laughs> I was going to say what little I know of that, though, is that the idea behind it is really to get the press and the attention. And I think that does make a lot of sense for the part of what he'd be. You know. Yeah, I, I, I like that, but it also seems like. Um, uh, it's funny, uh, Jordan just sent an email to some of us. Um, uh, he said, "I uh, he was watching um, uh, the podcast, Stacy. So oh. some kind of alignment and and stuff like that. Okay. Um, the you know the so along with all the weird capitalist business connections and stuff that are are wrought into um, Congress and the presidency and things like that. Then there's this weird shell of the press, which um, which is I I would I think the press." kind of like the, uh, the the political system we got isn't the political system you think that, you know, it's not the thing that you learn about in elementary school. It's a lot more Byzantine and complex and crazy than that. The press is kind of like that, right? Um, just because you have, um, uh, just because you, you sit in the president's chair, it doesn't mean that you have a, a deterministic relationship with the press or the ability to get to get the press to do anything that you want it to do, right? The press is running on uh, kind of a feedback loop of, of attention. And so it says crazy things, um, you know, like uh, when Mr. Trump was president, it, it, it didn't do the right thing to make the world a better place. It did the thing that made more press, right? Which just made the whole situation worse, right? Um, I don't know about President Biden as much, but with with you know his relationship with the press. But just because you have a bully pulpit, you know, uh, that would have worked 80, 80 or hundred or one hundred twenty years ago, it's not the same thing anymore. The press just isn't isn't. Uh, it's a very complex system. Again, and I could be totally wrong. I can't get inside his brain. I don't even really know him well. But my thought was it was about the journey to the presidency and yeah, what would happen with point. the press that was more important. Yeah, and, and I, I assumed, you know, I, I haven't talked to him at all about it. Um, and I assumed that it was more of a, I guess, I guess there's a, a difference um, between that at the one extreme, um, Trump running for president and for better or worse, the Trump brand being buoyed and hurt among different audiences because of its association with Trump versus um, Andrew Yang running for president and raising the profile of UBI, not because it's his thing, but it's like hashtag UBI or you know, Bernie Sanders and hashtag Medicare for all. Um, the, that if, if the meta project is something that exists 
at a broad level that is not specifically associated with Jordan the person, um, but rather, you know, he's he's somebody who's trying to raise its profile. Cool, and that's awesome, and I get that. And I'm I'm just want that to be. I, I mean, you know, my my hope is that that ends up being clear because I saw, I mean, you know, in the email chain, Kevin, I think heard that Jordan was running for president and immediately, I mean, to say Kevin got prickly, Kevin is prickly, but you know, <laughs> you know, it was, it was a, it was a flashpoint for prickliness as, as I assume it would be for many, you know, good hearted and skeptical people you know, when something becomes associated that way. So I'm, I'm just acknowledging that elephant in the room, like I said, I mean, to me, and, uh, and, and hoping that we can make it hashtag, I mean, just the way we talk about hashtag OGM as opposed to like OGM being an organization that we're hashtag meta project. Um, In terms of building OGM, <laughs> to come back to our, our purpose today, if, if people don't mind, um, where do you see the opportunities, Pete, for us to help you in the work that you're trying to do right now? Um, thanks, Judy, it's a good question. Um, uh, and the funny thing is, so I guess I, I don't work on building OGM, I feel like. Um, I work on building infrastructure for things like OGM. Right. Um, so the kinds of help I need are, um, well, or the kinds of help that OGM needs that would align with the help that I'm trying to give um, is uh, facilitation. Um, uh, facilitation to get, to help people um, help people use uh, uh, Mattermost, for instance. Um, I, I kind of think that we want to move, uh, and, and I guess Jerry had said this too, um, uh, it would be nice to get some of the conversation out of the mailing list and into a place that felt like it was more, more productive and a little bit more um, I agree. <laughs> I, I, a thing with the mailing list is it's the, the messages get long and then the whole thing gets messy enough that you, and you're having, yeah, yeah. Very. so um so we've talked about Mattermost being a place where we could have you know a little bit more structured conversations a little bit more space because you can have different channels right mm -hmm. um Mattermost actually ends up also being a, a place uh, because of the way it's chartered to be uh inter-community um you, you bump into folks from other communities there too which is a nice thing um so the you know, the reasons we haven't done that is because, um, or maybe a different way to say that, um, there's a there's a, a function that we don't serve well, um, uh, and none of the none of the communities have served it well. But uh, helping people use tools better, basically, just facilitating, right? Um, I guess kind of the same thing, uh, facilitating, facilitating calls and turning more of our calls and topics into knowledge content. That would be another thing that would, that would be super helpful. Um, I've got a, maybe, maybe I've, I've been, I've got a plan or it, it would be nice to, to make some changes to Mattermost, um, uh, uh, mostly it needs a version upgrade and there's there's some interesting kind of things around that that might be a little challenging for people who are using Mattermost. So I'm, I don't want to talk about it too much right now, but um, that would be something where if we had a little bit more hand-holding culture, um, help, helping culture around people using tools, um, that might be a, a useful thing as we do this version upgrade that I'm contemplating. <laughs> Can you put a link to the most recent Mattermost in the chat for me, Pete? 
Um, I mean, is it within CSC Agora or? Uh, CSC Agora, and, and when I say Mattermost, I mean what you mean by CSC Agora. Okay. They're the same thing. That, I just wanted to be clear because I wasn't sure, and I've been not monitoring that as regularly as I was previously. So. And there's kind of an interesting thing. Um, OGM for itself um, ought to, I think, be a little bit more deliberate. Um, this is this is where it's it's funny. I've got two hats, right? Sometimes I'm an OGM and sometimes I'm CSC. Mm -hmm. um, speaking with my CSC hat on and not my OGM hat, uh, OGM doesn't have a real good uh, uh, information architecture for its channels uh, on Mattermost. So the most general one that we've got is, or that OGM has, is OGM calls. Um, for historical reasons, that's kind of the, the general channel of, of OGM. So just, just re-architecting the, the, the channels on Mattermost would be a, a great big help, I think, for OGM. I agree, because when I, I hadn't been monitoring, as I mentioned with my hiatus, I hadn't really been monitoring that either. Mm -hmm. And so um, I had dreams of topics within multiple topic zones, yeah. um, not all of which I have made my way through yet. But I think that some conversation about that architecture or how to, um, I, I can see that it would grow immensely if we continue with the kind of initiatives that we have and it could complexify yeah. in a way that would make it difficult to use effectively. Yeah. Morning, Good morning, morning. <laughs> Good morning. Must be cold in California today. today, huh? <laughs> yeah, just up early sitting outside here. It's, well, it's, it's kind of Minnesota and we're supposed to get seven to 12 inches. So um, we're getting rain and it's cold in Southern California. It's it's in the, you know, the fifties. Oh my gosh. Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> that's <laughs> warm. <laughs> it's the warmest day Judy's seen in a while and I'm bundled up here. <clears throat> Well, we I just, were just uh, having a conversation, Jordan, about um, Mattermost and, okay. and how, how we triggered by a question from me to Pete, you know, how might we help him um, with what he's trying to do in terms of um, developing knowledge content and retrievability and yeah. different zones of knowledge content, you know, and we've kind of been covering the area of um, the human dynamic in addition to the content dynamic <laughs> and yeah. social change, you know, all these complexities and how do we make it sort of able to, you know, sort of like, can I look from the left, right or center and get that particular view would be a wonderful dimension, but the complexity of that technologically is way beyond my head and perhaps beyond the capability of technology, but it's those sorts of interconnections that, you know, what you want to do social change is how other groups have done it. And that's different from the knowledge content on the topic of social change that they're pursuing. That kind of, you know, that's a kind of cumbersome recap of what we're doing today. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, that's what. So we talked about uh, content and connection and uh, philosophy uh, as kind of big quadrants or triants uh, that, that OGM might think about. Um, uh, we, talked, uh, we talked a little bit about um, the Meta Project. Uh, we talked a little bit about Wendy Elford and Indigenous Wisdom and the, the work that she's doing into that. Um, uh, Michael had a good observation that uh, the, the running for president thing uh, is, a, is a strange attractor. Um, it, it, um, it, it wakes people up and, and some, some people go, what's, what's with that? Uh, so. Yeah, it's a, it's a, um, it's a, it's a double-edged sword for sure. Um, you know, like you saw from, from Gil's comment, it could, can, to a certain extent, create, um, confusion, but I think if, if, uh, trying to work with communications professionals right now and trying to be really like, cause I think if we can get it right and clear like you're saying at its best we can really separate that out and use it as an attractor that can help feed the meta project that's all through the nonprofit and not related to any one effort um but but hopefully those things can be be used to really drive more center of gravity and engagement i guess yep 
Um, that, and then just just a clarifying thought on that. It's also neat too because if if as a result of of that there's some degree of engagement that's generated and people engaged through nonprofits and a and a array of other um, organizations and long term efforts, then it's kind of like regardless of what happens in any one individual or local thing, something really special will be moving that can last, right? That's that's completely independent of political cycles. So. I think there's a way we can make them work well together. Good morning, Stacy. Good morning, Michael. Jordan, um, just a question on that 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 I brought up before, before you came is, um, I was citing the example of of Andrew Yang's campaign bringing attention to UBI in a way that it hadn't gotten before, though was known as a thing but certainly didn't end up coming across to people of as, oh, if, I, if I'm part of the UBI movement, that means I'm a supporter of Andrew Yang. They were you know, clearly distinct yeah. and, and UBI was hashtag UBI. The, the difference that, that I think is, is sort of an area of question is like, if, if the meta project is an entity in which, you know, that, that you are a, a director of, I guess, I guess how, that, how that reads to people and how you, we make that read to people is, has the potential for either quashing or engendering skepticism about things. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's a, um, yeah. It's a significant inquiry that we've been hard, hard at work on, um, both from a um, legal and funding standpoint. Obviously what you're saying is really important too, because um, there's a bunch of different areas of compliance that need to be very clearly delineated. So uh, our, our, our general counsel just sent, you know, just sent along, note trying to work on this too, you know, how from language all the way through legal structures that the whole thing's very clearly um, and transparently and appropriately set, um, you know, delineated and articulated so it works. Uh, but yeah, so we'll see. I think some of the questions, you know, and then some of what you're saying too will, will, can be resolved by the idea that um, um, I think what, with the, the the meta project and and Lionsburg and the hopefully will be empowering a diverse, large, growing array of independent named local entities with their own structures and things. So it may be that you know very in, uh, intentionally that's just kind of seen as part of the movement that's empowering um, thing. And and so people in those like. People in Factor, for instance, wouldn't necessarily have to support me in order to be empowered by the infrastructure and everything that's getting built. I guess if that makes sense. So that's another layer of separation. Sure. Sure. We've got, I've got the next, um, like say, I've got the next kind of call with branding folks um, today to try to really work on the different communication streams and stuff. As, as a branding folk, if there's anything I can do to help uh, in the next. <laughs> oh, awesome. Are you, are you a branding folk? I, I am. <laughs> oh, okay. He's awesome. good at it. Uh, yeah. I have been. Okay. So that's, so we're moving into your area. So um, would you, would that be joyful for you? Would you, would you like to be included in some of those conversations at the outset? Uh, sure. I would. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. The extent of my ability to contribute will <laughs> emerge, but you know, I, I would love to be talking about it. Okay, cool. Awesome. Fantastic. I, I wanted to drop uh, some infrastructure stuff that, that Jordan kind of related to something Jordan and I were, were talking about. Um, uh, Judy, this, this kind of, you know, there's, there's a bunch of, I don't know, infrastructure stuff. Um, uh, so capture, compost, um, distribute, uh, engage, and membranes and immune systems. Those are all important things. Um, but <laughs> uh, even more than that, I wanted to ask Jordan about meta values. Um, so 
uh, Jordan and I talked about, you know, these different decentralized organizations and each of them is doing things different ways. Um, uh, Jordan had this great example of uh, something that might not be a shared value across the whole network, you know, um, having a strict schedule, uh, you know, uh, some, some little collectives would, would be like, hey, you know, it's right on the hour, we need to be on the call right now. Um, and when we make uh, appointments, we have to be crisp and like do that. Other other little collectives might might be a lot more flexible. You know, it's like yeah, show up when you show up. You know, it's like oh, you know, I, I I'm coming in today. I, I'm sorry I missed yesterday. You know, the the cat got sick, or you know, the I I was was outside playing with the kid and I lost track of time. And those two value systems. Those are, are not something that need to be a universal value system, right? We don't need to run everything on time. We don't need to be super lax with our time. Different different little clusters might have different ways of thinking about that. But then there are probably some overarching kinds of uh, values and, and things, uh, culture that, that do need to be kind of fixed in stone. If you wanna be part of the network, probably you wanna be signed up for uh, a a set of, of real core cultural values. Um, Jordan, I'm going to read off uh, the, the ones I noted down. I don't know if this is the same list that you've got, but speak truth, um, love, help don't harm, um, help people develop, um, justice, uh, stewardship, wisdom. So those yep. are the, there's a set of things that, you know, you, you definitely want to kind of agree to, to be part of the network. And if you can't find your way to, to act in those ways, then probably you're not part of the network. Yeah. Yeah. There, that, that list there, truth, love, justice, stewardship, and wisdom. Um, we, you know, after kind of years of trying to, so, so I think what, what we're getting at is like, so let's say this more concisely, um, in some sense, there's only one, it's, it's like there's, when you start to break down values, you're losing just like the proper way of being. So you could have a central value that's like, do the wise right thing at the right time for the right reasons, you know, and it kind of has to encompass all the different things. But then you find out, you know, people maybe need a little structure. So we went from like one to the, the most overarching list of five that we could kind of discern when we went through this exercise was truth, love, justice, stewardship, and wisdom that seemed like um, core things that in all times and places um, kind of apply. And then we've also taken steps at like getting out to then, then there's the behavioral applications of what that looks like. Um, and so the, the people that I've really tried to study cultural formation with, uh, they'll go to, you know, articulating maybe a list of kind of 30 behaviors that start to really show up and how we kind of try to embody those together. But I think the, it's like in this kind of a movement inherently, you're going to have all different languages and different you know, like Pete was saying, it's just different cultures and we want that diversity. Uh, and so that, again, I think this is just like another area of the design build project. It's like, we're gonna need really smart people trying to work on how we forge some overarching culture that and the rules that can hold us together over time uh, while still celebrating, you know, diversity around the world. That in the diverse expression of the core values is maybe a way to say that. Thanks, Trey. Stacey, you want to speak that into the room? Sure. Um, what does justice mean? Might need some reflection around that. Um, yeah, there's a lot there. I don't, I don't know that I want to speak to it now, but I know that it's something worthy of discussion. Does justice mean fairness? Does justice mean, like, what does it mean? Because to different people, it means different things. Is it restorative? <laughs> yeah, how, how, does it, how does it relate to mercy? Is it restorative, uh, you know, yeah. 
where do, where does you know is there retribution involved you know <laughs> it's, it's yeah. Yeah. meant it for another time not for now <laughs> And, and just just a quick note to say, like, yes. And, and to me, it feels like if we can spark those kind of questions among a networked group of, of small groups who are wrestling with these things and learning together, that it's like, that's a victory already. Um, so people to wrestle with what does justice mean? Um, I, I think some of these things to wrestle with what does wisdom mean? Like, and, and how does it relate to what we're being inundated with like what does it mean to rediscover what wisdom is or justice and so some of those things might almost be like best left as questions as powerful questions um and we'll, we'll have to have enough framework around to know what we mean um but it's it's almost more maybe we want lots of small groups wrestling with the, the questions that you're asking stacy well, I specifically picked that one out because I think the other ones, there's enough agreement that you could have alignment and be a good working group. The reason I picked out justice is because that's going to talk to different communication styles and things that come up. And I don't have to you know, pinpoint anything, but if I look at what happened over the past few years with people being divided, yeah. justice plays a really big role in that. I mean, they all yeah. do, but justice is the one that if we started there, it would separate separate out some complexity, in my opinion. Well, part of the complexity in itself is noun verb distinctions in terms of what you mean, because mm -hmm. the definition of justice and the acting in a just way are, are somewhat dissimilar mm -hmm. and culturally influenced even under the best of circumstances. So I think it's important for us to frame core values and I support the list that you've discussed, Pete. I just think that how we would monitor that, how we would um, demonstrate that what behaviors would typify it? Um, how does the social system respond to non-compliance? All of those questions come in in any sociological dynamic. And that's great philosophy to talk about and it's how you practice it and live it day to day as an individual, but it gets much harder when you try to make it a collective responsibility. So I'm a little- it's. I, I, I don't know if harder is the right word. Um, it gets deeper and richer. Well, true. <laughs> so I, uh, a, a small epiphany I had was, uh, Stacy, thank you for saying, what's, you know, what's the meaning of justice? What's the definition? And, and Jordan, thank you for saying, it's, it, it, you don't want it necessarily to be a meaning, you want it to be a question. And, and that makes me want to say, you actually want it to be an ongoing discussion. Like you'd never want yeah. it to stop being discussed, right? right? It's always exactly. something, you know, like you talk about, what do we mean by, you know, or I, I, saw, I saw something that was just today, or I saw something that was unjust, or at least it felt that way yeah. to me. What, yeah. do you, what do you folks yeah. think about that? I agree completely, Pete, that's well put. What, one of the places this has showed up in an interesting way in my background is in the issue of safety and construction. Um, you have a very diverse array of, of workforce, um, very motivated to maybe cut corners. And so the issue of how do you keep, you know, hundreds of people on a work site safe and celebrating what that means, right? What does it mean for a, for the lowest ranking labor on a job site to, you know, shut the spread down? Um, because he sees that something could go wrong and someone could get hurt, right? And and for him to have the backing of the, you know, of the executives of that organization to stand up to the foreman or or the perceived authority to say no, this violates um, this violates it. So I think again, these are like the questions we need to wrestle with. And I agree, Pete. So what just to say what what they've discovered is like okay, every morning, um, usually in like the the huddle. There's just a question. It's like, um, who who saw an example, good or bad, of the type of thing that we're wanting here? 
And so you, you'll, you'll just basically have a culture of, of openly discussing it a couple times a day at the start of shift and at lunch. And I guess just on that ongoing discussion, it, it doesn't become something that's like, become something that's experientially lived and learned together i think yep. it's like and 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 socially uh it, it's a social object rather than you know an, an edict from above or something like that exactly it, this this reminds me of uh we've had a, a situation on the ogm mailing list which was consternating for a lot of people and we've actually had a few people leave uh, the list um and I, I was thinking about it. That's something that we we haven't been doing on the on the list. We don't talk about what the list means to us. Uh, what's you know what's something that felt good to us on the list, and what's something that didn't feel good to us on the list. I I have a thing. I, I, you, you guys, you folks know. Um, I have a thing that the mailing list, I, a mailing list technology is is something that was super valuable 30 years ago, and it's it's outgrown its usefulness. I think. One of the big problems with a mailing list is it's very hard to have meta conversations um, mm -hmm. uh, because you've already got you know interleaved threads of topics, and then to add you know a meta comment about each of those just makes it noisier and noisier. So um, that's a, another example. I I, <laughs> I don't mean so, to be selling chat systems, but <laughs> no, so, so. Right, because I as a, a person who has been on the OGM mailing list forever. Um, and there are various threads and my email system doesn't track the threads very effectively. So it becomes more cumbersome to participate. Uh, it, yeah. yeah. Okay, and, so, and the, so let's... The, the point I, I was really trying to make was that you, you want meta discussions embedded in discussions. The, the mailing list that I was on that did that super successfully um, literally had uh, 150, 250, uh, email messages a day and it's in its heyday so you know if 10 percent of the conversation was meta i, I don't know if i'm doing i what, what i was going to say is everybody could tolerate you know 200 messages in their day in their inbox each day literally and that was enough volume and ability to process that volume that you could have a meta conversation in on, um, amongst all the other conversations. But the list that we've got now, I don't think people would, would want dozens or hundreds of messages yeah, a day, yeah. right? Okay, so should we, I think that's um, what you guys were talking about kind of before, before I popped on, right? Because that's like very pragmatically, that's one of the earliest things we have to get right to hold a culture together, you know? Um, and so is that a good place to like talk, dive into this a little bit? Like what, yeah, what's definitely. our hypothesis on the, on what that technology and structure would look like? And maybe just one, well, one, one thing that can hold, well, yeah. So. Let's, let's, uh, let's one more thing it. before we, before we change course, I just wanted to um, come back to what you said, Jordan, about diverse expression of core values um, being like a way to look at um, justice and you know these 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 core principles. Um, the one thing I just wanted to stir up is that, as we've seen lately, even more so than justice, truth. Um, can be um, something that that diverse groups can hold in different places. And I'm not looking for us to resolve that now, but I mean, thinking about how, you know, whether, whether we're, when we're talking about truth, we're talking about um, information and knowledge and learning, or we're talking about, you know, which, which may differ when viewed from different perspectives, but are individually intending, well, I don't even want to use words like objective and, and like that, but, but truth seems much more the moral imperative than, um, than knowledge. And, uh, you know, that, that I'm just throwing out that, that question. Yeah, we've been we've been using the um, the uh, the phrase like navigating towards truth, mm. right? It it's mm -hmm. it's something that sits maybe outside of any of our individual 
things, maybe wisdoms like that too. It's like, and so what we're doing in community is like, it's like almost that's the absolute. And if we have the humility to go, maybe none of us see the absolute perfectly, but what we can do is we can navigate towards that in community, but by letting it kind of remain a transcendent ideal almost, then, then it, it's like becomes learning and sharing perspectives as we get closer to something that we know that doesn't belong to any of us. But, and then you can kind of, I find that in groups, you can start to arrive at something that approximates truth. It's like yeah. our words get close enough that we can kind of go, okay, yeah, that kind of makes sense. Right. Uh, it, I, this is, thanks. Thanks, Michael. And thanks, Jordan. This is a really fascinating thing for me. And, and to put a bookmark on something, another, another one in this realm for me is trust and expectation <clears throat> um you know saying i trust you is 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 a really fraught kind of thing to to when you start to pick apart you know but but anyway jordan i i really like the navigating towards truth thing but one of the things i learned kind of the hard way over the past couple of years is that it's what what i have found is that that there are different if if somebody if one person is navigating towards truth and another person is navigating towards truth it doesn't seem to me that they they are actually ending up at the same place they're actually aiming at different places and the the simple example for me is um uh sorry to take it down into the the, the super practical but uh vaccinations right um i know people um who are like of course you're going to get vaccinated. Why wouldn't you get vaccinated? The science says that you have a much lower risk of hospitalization and death and et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, it is objectively, they, you know, objectively better to get vaccinated. I know other people who are like, um, I don't want to be putting a engineered substance into my body. And um, in my reality, my objective reality, um, there are higher forces and higher beings that protect me from things, right? And and to the extent that you know, if if I happen to fall sick or if I happen to die um, because of my faith in in this objective reality, that's okay, you know. Uh, so you get these two people with, di you know, not converging <laughs> truths where somebody's like objectively i don't want to die earlier than i need to and objectively somebody says i'm going to die when it's the right time for me to die you know and and they act differently because of that so to me that that's why i think so if i were to look across the core values there mm -hmm. like in my mind that's getting away from truth because it's a it's it's more getting to an application so it's like to me truth would be what are the underlying facts upon which we're trying to make our decision then wisdom is like okay in light of everything that we kind of know what's the wise application individually in community like what should we do in light of all we know and so i think the that's where the, then this idea of navigation is again it's like maybe the efforts at moving towards truth are trying to clear away misinformation that's fogging our ability to think clearly right so we're kind of like trying to get to what's really the situation and then what people do it's like you know that that's then people are discerning trying to discern the wise right thing to do in light of what we know and so maybe a big service that, that we can do as we to facilitate the navigation towards truth is the clearing away of, of some of the opinions and misinformation and politicization that might be clouding our ability to to see and we might find that when we clear some of that away you know, we converge a little bit more, but totally understand what you're saying. Re related, another related thing is there are people, especially the, the U.S. is really good at this. There are people who say, well, um, we all stand alone. We're all individuals. We need to take, you know, um, uh, we, we need to work for ourselves and, and helping other people is actually hurting them because 
it, it doesn't make their life better. Um, so then there are other people who are like, no, we have to work together as a society and helping the, helping the weakest of us helps the, helps the whole society. It helps the strongest of us. So those are two, again, kind of, and, and I, I guess you're right. It's their applications of, I, they're, they're, instead of working on navigating towards truth, they're working on, um, yeah, that makes sense. And, and that's where I think too, like, so whether it's, uh, that's where I think too, there's, there's a certain invitation aspect, right? So just to like answer the second one, like I, I, I got to a point in my life where I dropped out of my Vistage group because I, it like wasn't, didn't feel like the best use of that one day a month to be gathering, helping each person self-optimize. It's, it's like, I want that kind of group that's focused on using our collective intelligence to help those who need it most. And if that's not attractive, it's like, there's other groups, you know, there's, there's Vistage, there's YPO, like there's lots of places you can go to find that. So I think part of also just just kind of putting the stake in the ground it's like well the this the fundamental logic of this is that if all things help one another rise towards their potential it'll be better and if if you don't believe in that it's not the way you want to work we're not compelling you um but you're also not going to be comfortable here you know so so let's talk a little bit about like the the um technology maybe both the technology and the social technology to, in light of what we've seen with OGM and uh, some of the recent hiccups, like, like what, what's the technology and the social technology that we might best leverage as we get diverse groups together um, to, start, to start working towards something higher than us all? I, I, th I think one of the things to say into that kind of is that you you want to you want to support diversity right so um uh mailing lists in the chat is maybe a, well it's actually it's a difficult example um but but different people have different ways of of or, or they have different devices or whatever you know so you kind of need to acknowledge or work with the fact that you're going to end up with maybe a middle of the bell curve is most people are using, you know, one, one stack, but you also have to um, honor the fact that there's other stacks than that one. Right. So, yeah. so right into that, as soon as you start, as soon as you kind of acknowledge that what you, what you end up wanting to talk about is interoperability, right. Um, yeah. The ability to move yeah. data back and forth, the ability to have APIs so that different tech stacks can talk to each other. Um, so I think that's kind of a core thing. You want to, um, you, you want, um, you want not a tech stack, but you want, uh, a kind of a, uh, uh, middle of the road tech stack and other tech stacks that work with it or the way that can work with it, work together. Okay. So, so let's, so I agree with that. Um, and I think, I think in our network, people on this call and, and people in the surrounding nodes have done a lot of work on that over the, the last few years. And so we might have a idea kind of how to, how to keep moving down. Um, really, really pragmatically on the need for also maybe one, also a middle of the road tech stack. It's like, it's like just super pragmatically, let's just take me. If you were to come to me and say, okay, Jordan, um, uh, and, and let's say that I'm, I'm responsible to people who are contributing funds and whatever for some performance metrics and stuff. So you can say, okay, we have this interoperable set of tech stacks, but it, it's like, okay, but I don't know how to access that, right? And it, it's, it, so it seems like for at least a core team who's empowering the diverse set of tech stacks, you'd want kind of a best practice place where people were gathered <laughs> so to speak. And you'd want to make that just like you're saying, you want to make that interoperable with other things. But like as a project manager, like I just found I needed to have the core people that I was coordinating with every day on. on. Uh, if, if I can kind of play that back, um, uh, one way to ensure interoperability is just to 
just to define the interoperational layer. Um, and then in practice, you go out and, and somebody says, yo, yo I, I just need to know what I'm going to boot up today <laughs> so that I can get work done. I don't need to be a theorist about how different tools fit into your interoperability matrix, right? Just tell me what to yeah. start using. <laughs> um, so uh, 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 in, in a, uh, I had a recent conversation with an old friend. Um, she's like, uh, she broadcast actually into a group uh, of folks and I was the one who answered, you know, she's like, oh my gosh, I'm tearing my hair out. We're using all this mishmash of tools. We're not getting anything done, right? Um, she's over there using Word with track changes. He's over here with Google Docs, you know, there's somebody else. And I'm like, okay, so here's, here's kind of the net net of it. Um, uh, depending on your, on your, I, there's a, so, so, so one of the key things I realized out of that was something interesting to me, which is that if you're talking collaboration um, and you've got documents, uh, you need real-time editing, real-time collaborative editing. Um, uh, and the reason for that is because uh, if you don't do that, you have a bunch of versions of the same document going back and forth, right? So you need to collapse everybody down to, go to this URL and type, and you can see everybody else typing at the same time. And if something changes, you all see it together rather than seeing it in a hundred different copies of the same thing. So the real time uh, collaborative editing experiences right now are, are the, the top ones are Google Docs and I would say HackMD. So if you're, um, if you're not a techie person, you need to know how to use Google Docs. Um, if you can stand a little bit of, of tech stuff or you're in a, a more open sourcey kind of environment, you don't want Google Docs, you want HackMD. So that's, that's a cornerstone kind of, you know, let's talk documents. Um, if we're talking documents, let's have one, uh, one place where we're all editing and we edit a document together at the same time. And that's either Google Docs or, or HackMD. Uh, in here actually is an, another one, which is NextCloud. NextCloud would also work for you, um, but there's a little bit of, of setup and stuff to go on. So, um, so then kind of the next thing is how do we keep track of stuff, right? Um, I, I've got a bunch of documents now that I've got to keep track of, or um, I've got a bunch of people in a, in, in a membership group, or I've got tasks to track. Um, I, I need to keep track of stuff, right? Um, there's, uh, this is probably a longer discussion, um, but uh, you, you kind of have a couple different audiences for that tracking. One of them is people who are just getting their stuff done. They need to be able to input, you know, status, update statuses or something like that, or, or they need to be able to find a document or something like that. So they need like in and out of a data management system. There, there's another persona which is the people who manage the data management system. Um, so those two kinds of people are disjoint, right? They're, or they're, they're different kinds of people. The, there's, so there are people who need to make sure there's data and there's people who need to use the data. Um, so you want a system that works for both of those, those sets of people. Um, and one of the failure modes is to say, everybody's the same and everybody is either a user of data or a manager of data. Uh, sorry, everybody is either is is both a user of data and a manager of data. You really want to separate those two roles out. So, the 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 short list there for me is um, uh, Airtable and Trello, oddly enough, and Google Sheets. Um, each of those has different characteristics for the two audiences, the two primary audiences we have, there's other audiences too, like another, another audience just needs dashboards. They just need, you know, a, a rich export of the thing. They don't need to 
do individual data. They don't need to manage everything, but they do need an export of a big thing. Um, uh, so uh, Airtable is super flexible and super useful, um, and it's super wonderful for people who are managing the data. Um, you need to take some special care to make sure that it's accessible for people who don't need to manage data, they just need to use data. So you can, sometimes you can make forms um, or, or export things with Airtable that help folks interact with it without interacting with all the complexity of Airtable. Trello solves that a little bit differently. Everybody's got a fairly simplistic view of, of what's in Trello. Everybody can kind of be a data manager and everybody can kind of be a data user. Um, and that's a good thing and a bad thing. And it works really well on some, uh, some, you know, some, some work groups and, and not so well in other work groups. I guess part of it is if your work group is of a, con of a uh, composition where you've got overhead people, you know, data manager people or um, things like that, then you can afford to have something like Airtable. If you don't have that overhead, if everybody's kind of just getting stuff done, maybe you want to use something like Trello. Google Sheets is actually a really interesting option, um, but uh, it gets harder and harder to use the, the more complicated your data is. Um, uh, so uh, it's, it's friendly for people who are used to data management, but not complicated data management. But as soon as they try to do complicated data management, they can't do it. They, you know, they should move over to Airtable. But to move over to Airtable, they need some handholding from, you know, uh, more experienced uh, uh, data managers. Um, so, so then kind of, I think where Jordan was starting this conversation was, okay, so now you've got a bunch of people who can, uh, create and manage documents and create and manage things like tasks and inventory lists and people lists and calendars and stuff. Um, what do they use as they're working? You know, uh, how do they, they message somebody and say, hey, I need to find this document or um, today is the day I'm going to be working on X, Y, Z. Can you help me on that? Or um, is she working on X, Y, Z today? And does she know this thing that I know that needs to get to be input to that, right? So the, the lingua franca for that is email. <clears throat> and email is still pretty good. Email for some people, some, for some people it's actually uh, SMS. Um, email is pretty good for like small communication, small quick communications back and forth. Um, as soon as you want to have a, a collective conversation, uh, SMS and email break down pretty quickly. Uh, so that's when we say, oh, you want a chat system, like you want Slack or Mattermost or Discourse. Um, Slack and Mattermost and Discourse are almost exactly the same in the way that they work. Uh, and then the difference is the audiences which they're um, they're streamlined for. Slack is streamlined now for corporate environments um, and commercial environments. Uh, Mattermost actually looks like Slack. It can be a Slack alike in a commercial um, environment. Uh, but since it's open source, it's also friendly for open source communities. Um, Discord uh, is a stealth commercial thing. Um, it doesn't seem commercial. The people who are, who are using it are, uh, it, it started off in the gaming community and now the, the people, the, it's, it's, it's got a reputation as being hip and cool kind of. Um, uh, so you wouldn't use Discord in a, in, an, in a commercial environment unless you were a games company and then you would only use Discord, you wouldn't use Slack because Discord is the cool place to be. Uh, in practice, all three of those things are almost exactly the same. They work almost exactly the same. And it's kind of the, you know, the valence that you want around it. Um, or if you want to not depend on somebody else running your infrastructure, uh, you can get Mattermost, set it up on your own infrastructure um, and run it yourself because it's open source. Discord is not open source and Slack is not open source. So, so the, um, from that standpoint of being able to run it yourself, um, Mattermost would be, would it be the last, the least fragile to um, 
someone else making a decision to not let you communicate. Like you could get kicked off of Slack or you could get kicked off of Discord theoretically, matter most theoretically, you could set up like some whatever, especially like, if yes. you're going towards interoperable, interoperability, yes. like you could theoretically decentralize numerous instances of matter most, maybe still be able to make some sense of things over time. Yes, that's that's true. Um, depending on how far you want to go down that road, um, you might pick something other than Mattermost even. You might pick um, Matrix, for instance. Um, uh, but you, is, you, you start yeah. to go t down kind of a um, com complexity um, usability curve. Yeah, um, I, would, okay. I would just interject. Sorry if I may. Um, yeah, please. Uh, that the further, I mean, you, you can go down the road of specificity and with every step you're less immediately interoperable, less familiar to, you know, I mean, if, if you, as Pete was saying, essentially, I mean, if you start with, you know, email, Google Docs, Slack, you know, Google Sheets, whatever, the, the Trello, the more people, the more people can be involved easily with a low learning curve and you're not, you know, bickering about technology or, or having to train people or being advocates for a brand new platform that, you know, most people don't know. But yeah, of course yeah. you can do better if you go further down. But, yeah, yeah. So but before we leave that, I wanted to say one thing about Mattermost and um uh resilience against uh censorship is maybe a way to, to say it um the the version of mattermost that i'm familiar with uh still uses a centralized service to deliver its uh notifications so as you get notifications on your phone that somebody somebody messaged something in a channel you're interested in that's going through a centralized service that mattermost runs um, and I think that would be difficult to replace. Um, so you, you'd have to work around that if, if you wanted to be censorship resistant. Yeah. And then, and then this, the, you know, matrix, uh, matrix gets uh, even more censorship resistance from being decentralized. You can have multiple servers that kind of chat with each other, but it gets harder tech, you know, technologically to, harder to make use. sure everybody's yeah, working together. Okay. So it seems like um, there's there's an increasing set of problems that we'll encounter as we as we go down the road. And so kind of on the, the lean startup and I think coming back to what you're saying, what Michael said, um, ideally, if there's a way that you can you can start light, I guess, as you start to get traction and resources, you can decide what level of complexity you have to handle. And so I think it's it's a matter of getting on the road, probably like Michael said with things that people can use um it, it's like we it, it's not a small feat to try to get smart people working together <laughs> on a higher order thing and so probably the more our focus over the next six months can be making it as easy and joyful as possible for everyone to not trip over things like that's the bigger thing and then if we have some budget and needs um and want to complexify down the road you know we can there's, I, there, yes, there are definite sweet spots, um, uh, and and I think, you know, when I look at different organizations, they have different tolerances for, you know, um, unfamiliarity or, you know, they they need something to be open source or, or they don't or whatever. Um, uh, there's a the a back to the document thing. There's a I, I don't know, bell curve or something where word is on one side. And, and I know people who say, I cannot type in Google Docs, I have to type in word. Um, and if you make me type in Google Docs, I cannot think. So either you want me thinking or you don't want me, I won't use Google Docs, right. Um, so, uh, so and then on the other side of the middle, the, so the middle of this document thing is Google Docs. On the other side of it is, hey, dude, I only use open source stuff or, hey, dude, I've used Google Docs for 
15 years now and I've generated 10,000 documents, I can find three of those documents. I can't find the rest of them because Google Docs is a nightmare for finding stuff. Please do not make me use Google Docs, right? So if you kind of draw a, a really simple spectrum, and of course there's hundreds of Word, you know, Word document things that you want, um, Google Docs is in this middle sweet spot where enough people can use it, it's close enough to Word that you should tell the Word people, hey, I'm sorry, we cannot work if there are a thousand Word documents floating around with track, track revisions on. It just does not work, it does not scale. Yes, you and your buddy can do it in the office. I don't care if you want to be part of our organization, you have to figure out how to use Google Docs. And I'm sorry, it's not that different from Word. Just figure it out. You have to use Google Docs. Kind of the same way with HackMD. HackMD is like, why? I, for me personally, why would I ever use Google Docs? Because HackMD is so much better. You know, I can find stuff. It's a simple markdown system. You know, this, this argument doesn't fly for 80% of the people, right? It's like, I don't understand Markdown. I don't understand why you have two separate views of the same thing, which looks so different. It just makes no sense. I've never seen it before. It, you know, does it, does it have comments? I, I need to, I need comments. And, you know, does your crazy HackMD system have comments? No. So again, you push everybody towards this middle sweet spot, which is a really good, you know, middle of the road option. Google Docs is, is really good. Um, uh, in chat systems, Mattermost is, is kind of a, a similar sweet spot, right? It's like, um, well, I'm used to Slack at work or I have, you know, like 15 Slacks I'm on and I don't need yet another system that I need to learn. It's like, get over yourself. Mattermost works exactly like Slack. Just use it, you know, swallow your pride and use it. Similarly, it's like, but I can't use a chat system because I, I only use email. You know, if I'm not typing into email, I can't think. And it's like, okay, but that means that we have all the complexity, complexity of email and none of the power of, of a chat system. And that means that we're gonna be super ineffective. Just figure out how to get yourself into chat systems and our chat system is Mattermost. So Google Docs and, and Mattermost have are very similar to the competitors, but they have a a virtuous set of of things that make it so that that's the obvious choice. You should just use it and and tell everybody, I'm sorry. Yeah. If you yeah. want to be part of a collective, you have to use those. Yeah, and I think I think that's where um, from when I look at it from an IPD lens, like sorry not to use jargon, when I look at it from the lens of integrated program delivery, there's going to be a small core group of people that are going to need to be really effective at working together, like a special forces team on each, on each, like of the, the individual or local work sites, if they, if they would prefer Slack or whatever, and it doesn't, there's maybe like a break point where we want to make sure that the, the center or the, um, whatever that center of gravity is that, the thing that is supporting and empowering other things is learning. Like, so maybe there's a way where you don't have to dictate Slack or versus Mattermost on the outside. But if you are then coming up to work with this core, highly effective team, then what you're saying is you're, there's just kind of a standard that's the aggregate middle of the road best practice. Google Docs are, are kind of like a super solution for that. Um, most people, most work groups should be using. Google Docs. I hate to say this because I'd rather, much rather use that. I'd rather use HackMD, I think. But um, and then most people should be using Mattermost. So, and then, and then there, we need to, we, the, you know, the collective we needs to work on better tools for moving things back and forth between different places, right? Um, right now, I actually use, um, uh, Wendy Elford and I, when we had a bunch of people needing to work on a document, it was in Google Docs. And then I hand built and hand, you know, moved stuff out of Google Docs into Markdown so that I could actually use it. Um, we need better, better tools for moving uh, information in and out of Google Docs and, and Word for, 
and HackMD. And then we need better tools for moving things uh, between Slack and Mattermost and Discord and, and email and whatever else, right? So then I think those tools end up working with APIs and they end up working with something very similar to Markdown. Um, you kind of have this lingua franca of, of data that moves stuff around. Um, uh, folks like uh, Michael and me and Vincent need to work on encapsulating uh, atoms of information, right? Uh, cards about a URL or a card about a task or a card about an event. Um, those need kind of standardized data formats uh, so that you can put an event in Trove and have it come out in Massive Wiki, or you can put um, a, a person's profile in Massive Wiki and have it come out on Factor. And then I think there are also human. Uh, you have a, you know, you might have a, a huge conversation in Slack and another huge conversation in Mattermost um, in kind of different islands. You need uh, bards and um, uh, minstrels going back and forth uh, across, you know, <laughs> uh, half a dozen, a dozen different communities singing the songs um, that kind of occur in the different communities to other communities, right? So that's in a in a baby sense, that's kind of what the bioduplex dispatch is. It's a you know it's a way for people to kind of coalesce what's going on in their island into a little news snippet, and then other people in other islands can read it and and tell what's going on. And then if they need to get together at a, dip, a deeper, richer level, they can you know they can contact each other and say, okay, I'm using Google Docs, you're using HackMD. How are we going to work together, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Michael, tell me about the Jester Guild. I was just, you know, as, as Pete was saying, uh, bards and minstrels, um, I, I was just, you know, thinking. To this myself. is, uh, this These is, too. Uh, this uh, totally agree. And, and David Bovel is actually our, our uh, sociological expert on, on the Jester role. Um, jester, jokester, raven um, role. Uh, um, uh, it's actually, I, I can't do credit to the, the, the pitch, but uh, you need uh, people who are willing to um, uh, speak to the, the powerful and speak to the masses and cross communicate between them and puncture egos and uh, gonna... make it a little bit of fun. Uh, super important role. You're, you know, your uh, Trevor Noah's and Stephen Colbert's. And... <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, got it. So, so on on the Google Docs front, um, <laughs> this is a silly thing I know, and it gets ridiculous, obviously. But I, the thing about Google Docs is. Um, So it, if this succeeds to anything that would remotely make it worth me spending time on, it will threaten other, it will threaten power structures. And so a concern with Google is that like, if they shut off, if they see something they don't well, totally like. Totally right. Yeah. Uh, Google Docs it, is not censorship resistant at all. And, um, and it could be like, it could be like me posting a video and they find some, something in my speech that they that the powers deem misinformation yep. but so if they turn off my youtube channel for instance then it, my, i think it shuts down like the whole thing right then any yep. docs yep. email whatever you like lose totally the whole ecosystem yeah yep. so um, um so hackmd uh, uh hackmd is uh, as judy says uh hackmd is something that's a, a fun and practical replacement for google docs um, it, I, I feel like it's actually more responsive uh, when people are typing and stuff like that. And so it's got its pluses and minuses, but it's open source. There are open source versions of HackMD. And so it can be censorship resistant. The, the other place that um, so some other more simple corporate tech folk um, for that reason, we're just advising like that the core, again, let's look at it as a joint venture, like a construction project. Um, at, at some core level, um, just run on 
you know, SharePoint and the, you know, the Microsoft package. Yeah. Um, um, the, uh, the thing I would use instead of SharePoint, um, uh, because that's a little bit centralized too. Um, uh, Bill Anderson and I over in Massive Wikiland have been using SyncThing. Um, so it's a peer-to-peer -peer file sharing service. Uh, everybody has the same, uh, you know, you have a folder and everybody that you're working with has the same folder and you put files in it and they synchronize across and stuff like that. Peer-to-peer -peer without any centralizing thing. And same thing happens to be fire and forget. Uh, you set it up once, uh, you get the settings right. And even that is, is easy and then it just works. You don't have to think about it. Mm, yeah, interesting. I have a steep learning curve on some of this stuff. <laughs> yeah, That's where, does. yeah, yeah. I mean, some of it I've used before, but it's helpful, Pete, to have the primer. I'm glad you recorded this because I can go listen to the explanation of all of them again. But at the end of the day, I'm just going to say, okay, what do you want me to use? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the thing about... I do think that the, the point you're making, Jordan, though, about um, insensitivity, not being sensible, sensitive to... Um, Censorship censorship aspects is really critical because um, I'm I'm enough of a free spirit that that rings my bells big time yeah that so the other thing about Google Docs is that um, feel free to use HackMD instead of Google Docs it's a better yeah it's better so <laughs> but, <laughs> okay so so for Google Docs you know the cancelability is tough the um, also, the preying on the data is tough. Michael's saying uh, Google Docs, Mattermost, Sheets, Trello, WayStation. Yeah. So, the other, so, so let, me go, close. let me go another, another direction just to test it on you guys. Okay, this, as, a, as a WayStation, for, for corporations doing things, Microsoft has put together a very integrated stack of tools, right? Um, that work together and are pretty proven. So my hypothesis that I was, was working with was the following. Um, there's, I think, some cool capability that can be developed through Open Impact, um, which you guys are probably not as familiar with yet, but it's, it's, one, it's, it's one thing to be advancing. Um, matter most for chat, for chat and then like just the basic Microsoft set of tools for Lionsburg as the, you know, kind of the core thing. So, because it, so it, like HackMD, are you doing Excel sheets in HackMD? I don't have a good solution for sheets. It's, it's like, so the thing, the thing about Microsoft is you can quickly spin up a pretty low cost ecosystem that's very coherent and tied together for a group to work with while we, while we figure it out. It's a, your data is private and probably can be made more secure than Google. Yeah, I, the not having it be open source is, is really problematic. If you, want, if you want scale, I think you want open source. The, the Microsoft packages get more and more expensive all the time. Microsoft is, is good if you're in, in corporate land, but as soon as you're in, you know, a different country that has a different licensing, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's like, so, so I think what you should look for if you, if you like that kind of solution is you should look at NextCloud. Um, NextCloud is a nice integrated suite um, and it's open source. I mean, the other thing is, you know, Apple with its adversarially interoperable Microsoft equivalents, you know, that's a world. I mean, the, 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 the corporate choices, Google is definitely one that you feel less great in your gut being involved with just because particularly with YouTube, you know, they, they do have 
a model that puts them in a position to censor. Um, now, I don't think that's as true of Google Docs, but it's still the same corporate umbrella. Um, and, and Jordan's right. You can get a takedown in, you, in YouTube that kills your whole account across, across uh, everything. Right, right. Whereas, I mean, in, in with, with Apple products and, um, and Microsoft products, you're uh, of the big five, the products of the big five, um, which I would almost count Slack like one of, but even though it's not. They're, they're owned by Salesforce now, so. Yeah, yeah, no, I know, but they're Salesforce not being quite big five. Um, yeah. Yeah, that, that just that I get the Microsoft or Apple um, and or Apple thing. Yeah, Apple's as, just as, as, Apple's as a way station. Apple's another one that that for uh, decentral like for okay, so we got two votes. Yeah, all right. So I see what you're saying on. So if we're going to create an interoperable set of tools to empower a global network of communities and organizations, and you, and you planted that in, you planted core capabilities in Microsoft, for instance, um, because the other approach that we can take to this is to say, okay, here, here was another, uh, I didn't really get my, uh, get my hypothesis out, <laughs> um, but the thing about the other thing that we could do with like a Mattermost and um, an instance of Open Impact, for instance, and other interoperable technologies, is you can white label and brand them, right? So, so that was another thing that that I was going to try to do is because again, it's like you can argue for interoperability, but you have to go to be able to find the prototypical kit of parts, and then if they're open source, people could go take them and redeploy them and use them on their own. But what I do want to have is a continuously improving thing that is named that people can find and be empowered by. So then it's like, well, what's the design criteria of that? And it's a, it's a kit of parts that are interoperable that can be deployed and localized, or it would be cool to be able to say to people, okay, we've got a, a pretty talented team continuously improving the stack. So if you don't want to go reinvent the wheel, feel free to use this, right? And it, it's kind of like a, it would be the, the middle of the road, best practice kit of parts for people that wanted to use it. And so like one of the things that I was thinking from the standpoint of brand, Michael, since you offered to help, <laughs> was, to, um, was to create a, create a Lionsburg branded platform instance of open impact and a Lionsburg branded platform instance of Mattermost. So you just feel like you're engaged in an environment. You feel like you're engaged in a branded environment. From that standpoint, then later, if we decided a better tool was available and you wanted to like Pete, so on our, on our platform conversation, let's say we're inventing a brand, we're inventing an Amazon, but a, a, a non-predatory good version it's like we could say okay we're going to go build something called lionsburg well what is it it's it's something that supports and empowers individuals organizations and communities to rise to their potential and flourish and so you could log in to these different stack of services well later if we wanted to switch out chat for instance we could find another open source tool to white label and replace that back end and just like you don't then feel like you're not dealing with like it would provide for continuity of experience, experience over time with continuously improving back in parts. And the other thing that that does is it truly forces the issue of interoperability, right? It's like, can, can you show up and insert a piece of functionality um, or not? You know, it, it really forces the issue of interoperability. It's like, if you name something and then go out to everybody who says they want to interoperate, it's like, okay, here's a place. <laughs> um, we have some budget and are willing to, to pay for this suite of services. Um, let's try to make these interoperate, right? And it's like a, 
very pragmatic on the ground test of interoperability. And then I think, you know, Pete, if we, if we go down that logic that you were talking about of the platform rant, and we, and we really stick to that with the pieces that we use, then that, then that would be something that's then built from the ground up on open source interoperable tools. And then you would just add in those capabilities at whatever rate you could. Um, and so maybe uh, to finish this rant, maybe in the beginning that platform is less capable than if we just imported the Microsoft suite, but it's more purely founded and then we just let the capabilities grow a little slower over time. Yeah, mostly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, is Microsoft, Microsoft is, is clearly the wrong choice for that. Um, the, it's, it's, it's hard to, even something simple like a chat system is hard to develop. Um, uh, so, so then something more complicated, like I, I wish I could have spreadsheets or I wish I could have documents. Um, the, the ability to, you know, develop those on your own or, or see that somebody else is going to or something like that is, it's, it's a theoretical thing more than it's a practical thing. So I guess partly you, you, you end up wanting to specify data interchange and let the tools float um yeah. yeah so a bunch of people are going to choose google docs you know and they'll copy and paste into your document solution yeah yeah, yeah. The, the hack md worked pretty well the last time i used it i have not been using any of these regularly because i've been somewhat in isolation but it it seems like this is an important conversation to have but then we just need to agree on something to go forward yeah and i think proof Prevention of censorship is pretty critical in my mind. Um, okay, so trying to just tie this and, and land it. Um, okay, so look at so, next cloud. Um, so, sorry. so uh, Michael and Pete, Michael and Pete, well, and anybody else who's, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Stacy, if you're an uh, expert on this, please also chime in. But so it sounds like we're saying chat and um, chat is matter most. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, that's, what, that's what I think I heard. Docs are question mark, but maybe maybe HackMD. <laughs> it just doesn't. It just doesn't. Yeah. Okay. So docs are question mark. Uh, uh, a, a way to handle docs is to say that they have to be plain text. I don't care what, what tool you're using, but they have to be text. So use Microsoft Word, uh, save in plain text. Use Google Docs, save in plain text. Use Hack and Bee, save in plain text. So you're basically saying and, that plain text. Sorry, Michael. Oh, I was just going to say, and we're looking toward a solution. I mean, even if if most people were using Google Docs day one, just because it's you know easy and lots of people know it, fine. You know, but we're we're looking for um, another solution here. Whereas Mattermost, maybe we're happy with happy with for a while. The, there's a I I think. Um, the reason we can be happy with Mattermost is that the use case for chat is fairly straightforward. Um, when you say, I want to do docs, you're talking about a whole bunch of stuff, right? And it, you, yeah. you can't end up with one tool that serves all the use cases. So everybody has to pick, you know, some people are going to have to use Microsoft. Some people are going to have to use Google Docs. Some people are going to have to use Scrivener. Some people are going to have to use, you know, TextEdit or, or Emacs or VI or something like that, right? You just, you can't say, but, yeah. but you know, the use case is so small that you could all use the same tool. It doesn't work like that. Text, text yeah. documents are, are trickier. So, so it does work to say, I don't care what tool you use. Here's, you know, and I, I guess save it in plain text. Here are the things that you can do with it. You, um, you know, uh, you have to have paragraphs. You have to have 
one line headers, you know, separating paragraphs or sections of your document or whatever. You can have a table of contents at the top as long as it's, you know, line, 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 whatever, right? You can specify a little bit of structure in there. But everybody can make plain text. Everybody can use the tool that they want. Um, I have to I have to say that I'm cheating a little bit here because I know that Markdown is like this much of a step up from plain text and having you know standard headers and stuff like that so once people are using plain text and exchanging plain text um it's it's really it's really straightforward to to say to somebody like judy you know you could be using a markdown editor and it would be almost exactly the same as your experience except that you'd have a little bit more power you know but you don't have to go there that's that's where that goes mm -hmm. um so and it's not because i like markdown it's because markdown was designed to be uh as close to plain text as you know humanly possible basically and that would be the hack md so that would be the reason why for for, well, even then, HackMD doesn't, uh, as, as when you say, wouldn't you like to be using a, a little bit better editor, you can pick HackMD or Typora or a bunch of other, you know, uh, markdown editors. So even then, you don't have to constrain everybody to a single solution. The reason to use HackMD and the reason to use Google Docs way back to when I started um, is because uh, you want, um, uh, you want, in, in a collaborative environment where, where multiple people are working on, on essentially the same document, you really want it to be in one place. You want it to be in real time editing and that's either Google Docs or um, HackMD. Okay, where, and then where do you, the, where do the documents for lack of a better word on HackMD then get stored? Um, let's call it not, not HackMD, let's call it plain text documents, right? Because I don't think we're going to sell everybody on HackMD. Unless you, unless you want to go there, I'd be happy to, but I don't think we will. Um, everybody should be using, everybody, you know, if you can use whatever tools you want inside your organization, when it, it goes to the, 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 what I'll call the Plex, um, or when it goes out to the meta project, it needs to be in plain text. So I think that's a, a good, simple, followable rule for everybody, right? So then where do you store the plain text files? Um, I think you probably store them in, a, 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 again, this is, you know, you can make lots of choices here. Uh, I, would, I would store it in um, a folder uh, on my computer that's synced via sync thing to everybody else's uh, folder in my work group. And then if it needs to go outside of the work group, um, probably the same thing. It probably actually is still using sync thing, but you could have um, you could have a document server. You could have a simple thing where you upload and download documents, um, files. You know, a file share system. Uh, Nextcloud so, is super good for this. Yeah. So I like what you just said. It sounds like there's um, there's like a few different levels, right? There's there's an individual working on something that gets synced out to a team. And then there's, there's teams that need to sync some subset of that out to the team of teams. Um, the, so, and, so and by you, the you, way that, you know, you're right. That's, that's how it goes. Um, individuals and, and then a team and then uh, a team of team members, right? Um, <clears throat> The, um, the plain text equivalent for a table is CSV, actually. Everybody can read and write CSV. You can use whatever freaking tool you want, as long as it turns into CSV when you're working with a work group of work groups. What is CSD? CSV uh, with a, a V like Victor. Uh, it stands for comma separated oh values. Um, and it's you know, it started from Excel, it's probably started before Excel, but any spreadsheet software and also database software like Airtable can read and write CSV. So, and you can create a table in Google Docs or Excel, turn it to CSV, give it to somebody else, they can turn it into a visualization in whatever tool that they're using, right? Their visualizer is gonna use CSV. And you lose stuff when you, when you go to CSV, 
kind of like you lose stuff when you go from fancy text to plain text, but everybody reads and writes CSV. Okay, got it. All right, so so I think that that's starting to that's starting to make sense. Um, okay, on on email, um, everybody has their own personal email addresses. That's probably the there's a certain this is another open versus closed thing. The the less there's a I guess a security question here that I'm there's two security questions. One is it's like you could give give everybody a a team email address, let's just say, um, that was that had whatever level of security we deem is necessary. You could also just go, okay, we're not gonna even go there. So everybody's just using whatever emails they want. Um, and we're just gonna assume that everything we write is public and there's no security. I, <laughs> well, the, you can use tools to make things secure. Um, but, but yeah, you should kind of assume that anything in email is public. Um, I, I wonder why you would want email. You could just use Mattermost. Internally, but communicating with external stakeholders is um, communicating with communicating and reporting out to granting grants, you know, donors. Yeah. Um, yeah. So again, I think you probably want Nextcloud. I don't know if Nextcloud does uh, email, but. How would you describe Nextcloud? Uh, Nextcloud, Nextcloud is like uh, the Microsoft suite, except it's open source. Um, so they've got a shared drive, they've got a shared calendar, they've got shared email, shared contacts. Um, it looks like they're, uh, I know you can do shared text files. I don't know about, well, you could do shared text files. Um, it, it looks like the um, spreadsheet that they use is Calabra, which is LibreOffice. But if you want, if you want group email, Nextcloud is probably the right the right thing. Everybody's using this, you know. So it's like using Exchange, except everybody's on Nextcloud instead of Exchange. Yeah, it's like everybody's going to be calendaring on something, and it's going to be Google Outlook or next cloud or something i guess um yeah and the question is yeah do, do you want that core do you want that core team to basically have an open an open exchange where um, yeah these are these are such interesting questions okay let's go to um project management uh is i i've usually used asana um, and I know Asana and Trello are close competitors. Is there? Um... They're one now. Asana oh, oh, are they? acquired Trello. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Um, Atlassian acquired Trello. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. Correct. <laughs> okay. I was, I was, yes. So I, I haven't tried it. Trello when I was when I was stacking up the feature sets just some years ago I went in the Asana direction instead of um, and and just a couple things on on the everything is a project logic one of the things that Trello might do the same thing but uh, there's an integration with Instagram that lets you create uh, create far more viewability into things I care about like critical paths and yeah uh, logic yeah it... the Atlassian suite just to to, I don't know what experiences Pete or anyone else might have it, you know, includes Jira and, you know, th there's, there are more complex things beyond Trello. Now. Trello is just like the super accessible. Their, their big, uh, their big products are uh, Jira and Confluence, which is a wiki. Um, Jira and Confluence are both 
both beasts. They're they're not fun software. Um, Trello used to be fun software, and I'm worried that Atlassian is going to crush it. Your soul. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, Jordan, yeah. you're 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 the so Trello uh, Trello at its you know unless uh, Atlassian screws it up, Trello is a super simple thing. It's it's not fancy like Asana, and if if you were depending on Asana to keep track of Asana does a great job of doing things like uh, conversations around a task and things like that. You know, it does a lot of project management, heavy lifting kind of. Trello is not like that. It's a simple issue tracker, basically. Um, with, and this is the important part, with a simple front end, it's, it's, it's just card based and you can move the cards around and stuff like that. And for most people, um, it makes it a lot easier to track things. Um, so this is another, yeah, this is another issue. I've, I've been wrestling with this just like you guys have for so long because it's so hard to, just as you're talking about this, I'm just going, there's no way we're ever going to get a, a large distributed network using Asana. Just not going to happen. No. Just not going to happen. So um, that, that gets back to each team needs to be able to use its own favored PM tools, but yes. we need to define what needs to flow up basically. Yes. And that's probably a CSV dashboard or maybe a JSON dashboard, depending. Um, at, at the risk of being, I don't know, naive or whatever, um, this level of technical discussion is really tough for somebody like me who's not intimate with all versions of all types of technical tools. Yeah. Um, so depending on who the audience is that we want to engage, that's a factor in how, as Pete has said, what the accessibility is for the user, in addition to how is it protected from censorship and other things that are sort of value framework dimensions that are pretty hard to compromise if you believe in the values. So I just want to throw that in. I've got lots of homework to do after today's session. <laughs> Well, that's, that's where I, you know, think coming back to the, the way station notion of saying like, okay, what are some things that everybody's fam as familiar with as they are email you know, imperfect stuff that lets yeah. us get started and get some traction, even if it's I, only I, for a couple of months onto, you know, I have to say email is last on my list of favorite because sure. I have so many different organizations. I even tried creating different accounts for different organizations to channel them into somewhere where I could connect them in a reasonable logic. But the volume is just so immense that it becomes interesting. I mean, I literally set up different usernames for different organizations that were generating a lot of email. And that helps a little bit, but not exactly. And they don't all, you know, this whole issue of interoperability across organizations, across people capabilities, across domains of expertise and specific goals is a really critical one. Yeah. Um, and, and having the ability to sort of discern a hierarchy of sensitivity to both the content, the shareability, the security, as, as we've been discussing for the last hour, I mean, I, I think it's extremely important because I have a big distrust for um, security <laughs> in terms of many different things and so I, I don't mean to sound naive here but well, yeah let, let's talk about let's talk about what, what Judy just said like um, so earlier as I was talking about Microsoft Stacy said um, you know from a core value standpoint I'm not sure that we can do that like even as a way station and then we have like another issue like this protection from censorship that affects us with things like Google or whatever. How, how, how important, I guess that's critically important. And then we just have to figure out the markers. Is 
this is going to be this is going to be so much of the battle. <laughs> we we have to we have to be able to empower people with a secure, non censorable suite. Did I hear right that um, Mattermost is protected from censorship? Because if it is, then I just want to share not knowing 90% about what you're talking about. I would say that that's, and again, going by just using me as the typical non-tech kind of person, I'm very comfortable talking in Mattermost. Um, I've used, I've been exposed to Trello and Asana, and interestingly enough, Yesterday, I was thinking I should go back and use the Trello board for this. Um, so, I, so if if Mattermost is protected from censorship, I would my vote would be that's a good place to start. I mean, I, I'll I'll dissect that a little bit. Dissect that a little bit. Protected from censorship is something different. <laughs> okay, well, um, whatever Jordan's talking to, I so, don't think it's hard um, for me. <laughs> so. Where we ended up with Mattermost is censorship resistant, um, is that it's open source and you can run your own copy of it. Uh, so to first order, um, anything that you're running is censorship resistant as opposed to something some big company is, is running is not going to be censorship resistant. Um, uh, so um, so if you really want to be protected from censorship, then you then you start using fancy uh, fancy architectures like decentralization and encryption and things like that. Um, so I don't think we have to get that far yet. Um, we could, um, but just yeah. So what so what we'll do over time is like these things will end up on roadmaps, right? There's like these different features of work that need to be built. They have roadmaps over time, you know, and we'll we'll have like. So what we're trying to just do now is get down to something that'll work for this quarter to get us off the ground and like to where we can define those. I think three to six months from now, we'll know we'll have had more of these design conversations and laid out like what those pathways look like. Um, and then we'll also know how much resources we have, right? So if we, we really articulated that pathway towards a fully decentralized encrypted communication network that included all these sets of tools that could empower organizations and communities around the world to communicate with one another truthfully without being censored. And let's just say that that would take X million dollars and X amount of time to do. Like I'll go pitch that because there's people that would care about that, right? I mean, you, you see that happening. And so if we could really articulate that path, like that would be something that's super fundable. Like I think there's people that would want to fund people who were willing to work on that. And so, so here's what I, I'm going to go back to what Stacy just said. I'm wondering if, if, if just from my standpoint of, of trying to project management and see if we can get this off the ground, I'm wondering if we get into these layers of complexity, we'll, we'll crash and burn a little bit too soon. Um, and in the beginning, we need to keep it really simple. So maybe it's like not getting down into the tools that the, the teams are using in the next 90 days and just staying out of that but just setting up the, the Mattermost chat and like maybe it's building simple forms or questions. Does Mattermost do what, um, can you program Mattermost to ask people questions on rhythms like you can in Slack? Uh, I'm not sure, let me check. But I guess where I'm going is if, if we could take a chat system like Mattermost and then we could just prompt people to ask certain questions that would that would expose what they're working on and what they care about and why that would be enough just to start us getting the map and the lay of the land and and that's, getting that's, moving that's a good hypothesis um i would like to bake off something else with that which is um agreeing on a set of document types so, so plain text for proposals and stuff, and maybe we'll have kind of a template for um, a MOU or an agreement between between teams, and then exchanging um, CSV sheets of um, projects and project 
um, tasks and and uh, task completions and stuff like that. I think that I think okay. that's more more fruitful than the form um, than the the chat bots. Okay, okay, I'm going to change my hypothesis. So um, <laughs> this is maybe getting back to guilds and superpowers. Like we're trying to dumb something down to a level where everybody can participate. Maybe that's the exact wrong approach and we need a small program management team. So we need like some simple common denominator, but I wonder if there's a way to get a small project management team, for instance, that is running a, somewhat of a sophisticated project view but mm -hmm. we're not trying to get everybody to engage that. We have one or two people that are like, <laughs> Pete and Jordan are maintaining that. Um, and we can just give everybody snapshots of it, but maybe there's a way that we're taking core information and populating that and making that a little bit better over time. Same um, with like- I, I, I like that one. Um, so I would still bake that one off against the, let's define a, a small set of, of key, um, data things that get exchanged. I so the, the the reason not to do that, the reason or the reason not to do the expert, you know, a couple of experts running. Even you could even pretend that you're doing it in a more networked way or something like that with you know Pete and Jordan. The reason not to do that is because it creates a bottleneck from the beginning, right? And you you bake in the bottleneck despite yourself. So yeah, yeah, if you yeah. turn over the the project management, make the project management visible, you know, okay, she's doing it in Trello, he's doing an Airtable, they're doing it in Asana. Everybody is publishing CSV dashboards. Everybody yeah, gets okay. to look at the CSV dashboards, everybody gets to participate in them, everybody gets to play with them. Um, okay, got it. If, we, if we're got doing it. things with other organizations, you know, we can, we can translate. Easily. Does this all come back to the to basically the the platform idea of defining like the the six key kind of things and then yeah just making those kind of mandatory I guess yeah okay we're so close let's land the plane so what's that small let's uh, let's articulate that the best we can like very concisely so what are our let's make uh, five to ten bullet points um just lay out a hypothesis. Can you can you type them in the chat so we can all see them? I'm on an iPhone, but maybe, uh, maybe can someone else can. I'll or, try. Or... Go ahead. I'll try. Um, I think. Be able to also. I think the. Uh, so so for me, where where it comes to is is what. I, I've been calling, I don't like this name, uh, atoms of, of information, basically. So there's, um, uh, so there's a person's profile, um, maybe what I'll call an event, uh, like a, 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 um, a, a meeting is an event, right? Um, uh, maybe there's a task and a project which is composed of tasks. And maybe a timeline. Uh, what other PM things do we need? Oh, a, a proposal. Um, a final write-up uh, and an MOU agreement. So if you had templates for all of these and, and they get saved either in plain text or CSV, <laughs> um, I think you've got kind enough to work on. Uh, it would be nice to have a dispute dis, dispute thing. Um, Stacey, these are not the six. Well, I, they, they kind of are and they kind of aren't. <clears throat> I agree with the dispute resolution. Yeah, so you, so you have 
So Stacy, I think to answer that, what Pete just articulated are atoms of information is one of the few things that, that he's saying is critical. The second thing is dispute resolution, which I agree with. Like to call this like relationship management and dispute resolution. Like we want to have a proactive process of. Uh, um, she agreed to have this task done on Friday the 19th. She hasn't completed it and it's, you know, Monday, the Tuesday, the 23rd. Um, I, I am in dispute with her over her payment. So then that gets kicked up a level and somebody says, okay, so what's the deal here? Let's renegotiate the payment. And then, and then you report out. So that's essentially a, a lay judge. The lay judge makes a, a ruling and then that the, the, there's a dispute resolution. Um, agreement XYZ is, is uh, modified to be XYZ prime um, and the terms have changed in these ways. So the, uh, the other technical eyes we need on this um, uh, is the flotilla group, uh, which we've got a good chunk of the flotilla group here. Uh, we need Vincent, and it would be great to have Wendy McLean. Um, um, we're getting into a couple things that Marc Antoine is really good at too, and, and Jack, Jack Park. I guess the question that I have here is, um, are we, one of the questions I think with the, with the whole stack is, are we facilitating um, movement creation or entity creation um, or emphasizing one over the other? Because I think- What's a movement and what's an entity? On. What's that? What's a movement and what's an entity? Well. I'm uh, talking about the movement that we're not quite formfully engaged in and, you know, wanting to spread um, versus the, the core structure within the organization an organization I, again sort of going back to the the um, UBI or you know Medicare for all or Black Lives Matter or you know the sort of movement that you want there to be um, parallel diverse perhaps localized um, entities of and and want to build in a way that's replicable and and, and permeable um, and and so I'm, I'm just asking what we're doing right here is um, is more specifically organizational with the, the, the last few things that we're reeling off as opposed to the, the stack i'm just asking so, okay so i think what i'll just tell you from my perspective it's like yeah. um what i what i need to accomplish is i need to build an organization that can spark a movement okay. and serve that movement right so i so i think looking at that it's like just for me mm -hmm. it's like as a project manager i need to create an organization that has the funding to support a core group of highly functional people that in turn will serve and empower the, the, all the diverse expressions of movement around the globe. And, and so what that's called in construction, it's like a core, they call it a core IPD team. It's like, you, let's say you're, you have work going on on 50 different job sites, but they're kind of part of like a single program of action. There'll be like a core team in a headquarters who's helping those team, empowering and solve problems for those team. And so they might be working in a different way, right? So I think that's where the, that's where we have a couple layers that you're very helpfully disambiguating. So so maybe it's like um, maybe I should just ask, okay, I need to build a 
a core team who's going to operate in a way that will ultimately be interoperable with everything we're empowering. But we ultimate, but we just need to get up and running, right? And then what I think that, what I think will end up happening is I might have a greater, me and that core team may want to operate at, at such a high level that what we need to build for ourselves is more advanced than what most of the teams need. And so then it's like, you can turn around and just go, okay, if you, if you are, haven't already developed something more advanced, like feel free to use this, right? Almost like you can right, use right. Amazon. It, it's like, that becomes yeah. almost like Amazon. And then you can turn around to anybody and go, hey, if this infrastructure is useful to you, like plug in, uh, no obligation, but, and then, then we'll define just the core. Okay, I'm hearing you. That makes sense. So working from the bottom up, what I'm envisioning is a, a small team. You, I can imagine, Michael, you've made an agreement with Jordan uh, to do a branding, uh, a branding design on a Mattermost, right? You're designing the skin, getting it deployed and stuff like that, right? So you, you've got a small team of folks working with you, three or four or five people. Um, you want to express that agreement with Jordan. Um, Jordan, you know, I, I, I accept the responsibility of delivering uh, Mattermost skin deployed on your server, you know, in two weeks, um, you're going to pay me uh, X hundreds of dollars to do that. Um, and here's the dispute resolution um, stuff that we're signed up for, if it comes to that. Um, here are the, the milestones um, as part of that project. Uh, and I'll give you daily up updates on the, the project status, right? So some of the things I listed, you know, I, there's, an, there's an agreement there. There's a reference to the dispute resolution agreements. Um, there's a project plan. Um, the project plan, your project plan, fits into Jordan's larger project roadmap. Um, as one of, you know, a bunch of things that he's doing. Um, every day, you can um, push a button on, maybe you're using Asana, maybe you're using Trello, maybe you're using Airtable um, to keep track of all of your stuff. You can push a button, export a CSV uh, that says on milestone one, we're three days behind, milestone two, we're two days ahead, milestone three, we've got a dependency on uh, this other team. That goes to Jordan, it rolls up, uh, he sucks up that CSV into his system and he says, okay, now I can see on the Gantt chart where Michael is inside his project and on the roll up Gantt chart, I can see that Michael's project is, is affecting or not affecting the rest of my timeline. So Pete, we'll have to do just some magic to make that work behind the scenes. This is where we can describe this in a thousand ways, but it's like, I think for, it might be easiest for everybody just to understand that I, I'm like, there's something, it's like, the, like an architect has an idea and, and we just need to get it built. And so we're trying to get commitments from teams to do things. And just like you said, like, and there are things that we all need, right? It's like, it's not, um, so we can all, I guess, bubble the best ideas up. Right, and then we're going to distribute those back across the different projects. Then Pete, you're saying if, if we can come up with really simple ways somehow to get that information, you're exactly right. It's like there's different milestones in the project plan and you want to know if you're ahead or behind and if you're stuck, like any dependencies that someone else didn't meet. You know, um, you know Pete, you were supposed to, like let's just take this Mattermost example. Like I had a separate agreement that you were going to help procure the server space for Lionsburg and get that up and running by Thursday so that Michael's team could put the skin on it. And so then we would want to know if those pieces are kind of happening. And so what we're doing is then we have different teams unfolding parts of something that's coming into existence, you know, the, the way that it's like the mad, the mythical, the mythical world, uh, so I chose a mythical name like Lionsburg, but it's like, I have a, like, we're, we're dreaming of what this type of place could be like. And then we're all taking little steps and making commitments that are making the reality more like that every day. And you can see it kind of measurably coming into reality. It, it's a, 
So, so then we could track all of that in Asana um, or Airtable, um, or we can distribute the whole thing and somebody's tracking it in Asana and somebody's tracking it in Trello and somebody's tracking it in Airtable and somebody's tracking on, God forbid, Excel. And we don't care what they're tracking it in because we've agreed to do data interchange um, and everybody knows how to, everybody's figured out how to write the data interchange and then they're scared to death and they're working with their IT staff on reading the data, data interchange or, or displaying it in a useful way or whatever. And then it's not like a couple entities, it's like a thousand or 10,000 entities all doing this together. Exactly. It's eventually what you want. At the end of the day, um, it's a network of, of commitments, basically. It's like a network of promises made and kept to one another that helps something come into reality. That's the, as far as I can tell, that's the fundamental unit is it's like individuals rightly relating to one another, making commitments and keeping those commitments. And you could just measure that network of commitments. And then the bullet list of stuff that I kind of rattled off is when you're making commitments like that, you have to have, we, we want to do this all, all in fairly plain text, right? So, because then we get the data interchange, but then we have to specify the way that you articulate a progress step or a commitment or something so that you can automatically read it and roll it up. So that's what I'm talking about. There's a, a way to template the, the plain stuff in a way that is interchangeable and isn't. The, the, the failure mode would be a couple paragraphs in an email, right? Um, uh, so the, the, And the way that the, that the world still works is if um, Jordan has an agreement yeah. with Michael and Jordan has an agreement with me, you know, Michael's in charge of branding and I'm in charge of the IT setting up the Mattermost system. Right now, even today, the way to do that is with an email. Uh, you know, there's a preamble. Um, Hi, Michael, hope you're doing well. Um, about that project, I had some questions. You know, can you tell me what the status is of this question? You know, this, you know, and, and then Michael sends back a thing. Hey, Jordan, I'm doing great. You know, the the project is doing eh, kind of okay. You know what I mean? We talked about it over the phone, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's state of the art. We need to get out of that into templatizing it. So yeah. it's, it's, you know, it's a, it'll look like a thing in Excel or a thing in a, a sauna. In a sauna, it will look like there's a project and they, these are the milestones. In Excel, it would look like a bunch of whatevers, but then no matter who's reading it or who's writing it, I can tell where Michael is, I can tell where Peter is, and, and they don't even work together, they're working through Jordan, who can tell what everybody's doing, all the, you know, all the, all the people he's working with, he can tell what's going on. So we need those templates for, you know, this is a task, this is a, a, this is a status, this is an agreement, this is um, a, 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 a dispute um, uh, pleading, you know, this is a judgment whatever those are i don't know if that's i you know that's a, a a close he's getting there getting their list of what we need just, just as a quick aside to keep aligning our minds like as stacy and michael i've talked with you a little less than pete and judy on this but you can imagine if you could create that that transparent network of talented people making and keeping commitments to each other what that leaves in his wake is a is an extremely measurable accountable chain of things actually happening and so you can imagine how fundable that is in comparison to the way that like nonprofit and impact work now you like request like let's just let's just take the example of jerry it's like okay I'm, i he wanted to he was going to do a podcast he got a grant for 25 grand just as an example and then he's going to report back some months later on on what happened but you can imagine if it's like, let's say a grant came in for 25 grand and there's actually a set of things that need to happen in order for a podcasting capability to be up and running. And so there's sort of like contracted for and whatever, you, you'd have just total transparency into how it happens. And then the idea would be like what I've been talking with Jerry, it's like, oh, that's funny because I also need to podcast. Is there a way that, that instead of you doing that and me doing that, we can leverage this $25,000 grant 
to create a capability sitting in the commons mm -hmm. that you can use and I can use and lots of other people can use. And then we can start continuously improving that capability. So it's like one at a time in response to the actual needs, you're setting up shared capabilities, hopefully, that are kind of continuously being improved. Um, and then that gets to be a, a really cool fundable movement that that is, you know, will have a, a level of measurement and efficiency just far, far beyond what's out there today. Um, two, two things, so then going to funding, there's two ways, there's two things that'll be the case that are really important to address. In some cases, there'll be, there'll be fiat currency available to fund commitments. In other cases, there won't, but that doesn't, but like right now you're seeing in, in OGM, there's already a lot of people doing things and making commitments that maybe aren't paying each other for it. That's, that's where um, like Michael, I've been working with Michael Lenton on the idea of community currency and how you could take that same network of, of commitments and have a community currency. Because let's say that maybe Pete's willing to set up the tech server and what he needs is an hour of branding time on something else. And so you guys just decide you're gonna, so like without having any fiat currency, Pete can just decide that he's gonna go in debt an hour to you, Michael, um, and then, or whatever, then that debt gets relieved when you do something and because you both value each other's time, there's an exchange of value that, that produces value for the community. But so that community currency is, is a really key piece to this as well. Um, and then there needs to be basically, so my thought on this and, and I don't wanna go down this hole, but if everything was denominated in a community currency independent of fiat, then everybody could voluntarily do whatever they want to do, right? Then there's a way that says like, okay, based on how much fiat's available, how does that match up to, like what was the community currency worth this month, so to speak? Or we'll have to figure out how that works. Or, And some people might just purely want to, they might not want to suck off fiat. They're just volunteering their efforts, right? And they, they do that joyfully because it's what they want to do. And they want to make sure the fiat flows to the people who need it because um, they don't need it. Other people might just go, man, I can't pay rent, so I can only do paid work this month. Um, so I think that's the other key thing for the community to function is to not constrain it by either one. That sounds like a good core value. I don't know how we frame it that way, but I like what you're saying. Yeah. And if I hear you right, I'd like to, to pose a question, maybe not for today, because uh, we're heavy into what we're doing right now. But I think if, if we look forward into sort of the sociological impact and approach of what we're trying to do, that's another whole dimension that would warrant some discussion in terms of mobilizing people, engaging people, those kinds of things. That is a dimension of social change that can't be ignored and may or may not be really within our purview, but we should frame what it is that we're trying to do. Agreed, Judy. Okay, um, so, and, and just on that really quick, I think the, um, my giant challenge in, communicate, in communicating all this, I think it's, it's like, I think that frame of the multiple steps of it's like setting up a small, effective, highly effective team and organization connected up on one side to resources and on the other side to a bunch of efforts that are being empowered. Um, it, it's like each of those teams has unique things to do. My, my concern right now is setting up the core team and the core infrastructure to build the movement and empower everything else because that'll then catalyze all the all the subsequent steps. And so Judy, then I, that gets your your question that you just asked, which is okay, from the standpoint of that small team, what's the engagement strategy and impact and wise strategy and plan of action for how that unfolds? Sure. Like no, the, I, I understand. That's why I said it's tabled for now, but I think there's a whole even within the core team, there's enough complexity that we should have some attentiveness to that yes. framework. 
And then that framework should be scalable in some way or known to not be scalable and need modification as we go forward into engagement of more and more people in a larger movement. Yeah, yeah. So we'll wanna like, so that gets to something like, um, I guess just to, it's like, that's something like the core team's gonna have to forge a culture that's again, a prototype. Um, and we're gonna wanna model whatever we would, we think might be somewhat of the best practices for teams that form. It's like, we're gonna wanna walk through that ourselves and be documenting what we're doing and how it's working and what's working and what's not. And then in, a, in the wake of forming the core team, if there's a second team that wants to form, it's like, okay, well, here's what we've learned so far in trying to do this as a result of all of our experience, you know, in the past and in this current stage. So start here. And if you don't want to make the same mistakes, great. And so then you start to have that core thing that's continuously improving, right? And if three right. more teams form and they, they learn more lessons, it's like they can feed those back and will improve that process. Exactly. So each time it gets deployed, it gets better. It, it's sort of like viewing a social movement as a document under revision. It, it's a bad metaphor, but I mean, we're crafting something that's starting with a nucleus of a finite number of people, but we envision it becoming a global movement, which will get personalized at infinite numbers of different ways as it becomes a global movement. So I'm just kind of wanting to call the question that we be sure yeah. we understand some of those dynamics early and endeavor to be careful to build in best practices and key factors because social change gets really dendritic fast if it takes off and trying to pull it back in to get it to a central theme is very difficult to do. And I'm not sure we would want to try to do that anyway. I'm just saying this is another whole dimension that's equally complex to technology is yeah. social <laughs> And, and I don't want us to overlook that dimension. A, a person who's really good uh, would would be really good in that conversation is Wendy Alfred. Mm -hmm. And and uh, Jordan and I, uh, Jordan and Pete and and I, Wendy Alfred, I think, have kind of a date to talk about that at some point. Judy, would you would you like to join that? Um, that was going to be yeah. the specific genesis of that call was um, Pete and I talking technology and realizing that we needed some insight on social stuff. So uh, would you be interested in joining that conversation? If, I, if it fits, sure. On the social tech, okay. It's just that I've done a lot of organizational human change management in large complex global organizations. And so it's not like I have a tool list or even a tool set, but I have trying to get the global corporation of 3M to agree on how to tackle whatever or yeah, similar yeah. scientific professional societies to coordinate on key messages for social responsibility, scientific responsibility. It's the same kind of thing. And so if I can help with that in some way, I'd be happy to do that. Jordan, should I send awesome. out a, a scheduling poll for that? Yeah, that'd, yeah, that'd be great. Um, and Stacy, Michael, do you guys wanna be in on that? I, I would be interested. Uh, okay, I'll, wonderful, uh, wonderful. Okay, so so we're going to have to learn together how to do this. One of the other things that, um, so the reason that on that last email, I, I expanded it out, because what's the, the really, really neat thing that's happening is there's a couple different centers of gravity pulling. And, and so I'm trying to figure out how to get all those people to know each other and see what we're capable of together. Because otherwise it's like, like, branding conversation there's like small groups here and small groups there so i'm trying yeah. to figure out so i so i was thinking basically i need to try to introduce each other and then say okay there, there's going to be conversations on messaging and branding over here it's going to be conversations on tech over here you know and so we're then people can self-select project management over here then people can kind of self-select out into the different circles that are joyful for them to participate in without uh, you guys have any feedback on that or does that sound like the right approach at this stage? And that, that I think I need to think about it a little bit to, to really answer your question thoughtfully, Jordan, and, and maybe give a little more 
analysis to what you've already sent me recently. Yeah, okay. I think, it, it, I think what you're suggesting makes sense. I just think that I want to the think one thing about, I would do differently is, is to put it on a Mattermost server instead of email. <laughs> yeah. The string of emails is a little confusing, to be honest. Uh, so Mattermost. Okay so, okay, so what? Okay, I think we've come to this. Okay, so what would it take for us to get a skinned Mattermost instance up and running and stewarded by the nonprofit that could be a central place that people could start to gather and discuss? Uh, I don't know anything about Mattermost skins, um, but uh, here's here's a set of themes that are free. It looks like. Yeah, I was going to say I don't think that that Mattermost lends itself so easily to skinning, but it's so bland that yeah, you know, it's not like it's not like you feel on a lot of platforms where it's like. Mattermost. We're all about Mattermost. I mean, I, I think the only thing that we might do at some point is if we wanted to make the icon that appears on your phone screen, you know, branded as opposed to Mattermost because it was this one instance served, we could, but um, I, I don't know that we want to go too far. I, I think that's probably you know, true. I think, I, yeah, I just saw in there that you can white label it. So I just yeah. thought if we're setting it up, we might as well just swap out the brand. Um, so, and then... so here's a, a branding thing up here. Um, and it's just text, right? It's just a name. Um, and then you can pick colors. And that's about it. <laughs> I'm sorry, what are you looking at on the left here, Pete? Uh, this, this over here? Well, I... I'm, I'm familiar with Mattermost. I wasn't sure what was behind it and whether I needed this is, to. This is uh, our Mattermost and it's uh, default colors. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's pretty much all you see. And and then you got a brand up here. This is, everybody sees their own icon here. Right. Um, so you, you come up with a name um, and then you can make it look different uh, in these ways. These are, oh, are okay. themes that people have. So a name and colors. Yeah, I was not familiar with that left screen. So that's that clarifies that yeah. for me. Yeah, I think if there's a way, and I think there might be for the app to appear to people, you know, branded. With an icon or something like that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, where, where the, the matter most, where that default matter most icon appears now and the word matter most. Yeah. Looks like we lost Jordan. I wonder if he'll come back. Yeah, it'd be nice to keep him on if we're doing this conversation around <laughs> this topic. <laughs> we can wait for a little bit. So while we have a minute, I just wanted to suggest to you, Pete, that there was a point where you said this is where we should bring in the people from the flotilla call. And yep. I was going to say it would be good if you could send them at least the part of the, you know, towards the end when we start talking about this, if you send it to Flotilla before the Flotilla call, and maybe even the two other people, um, I think you mentioned Mark and Jack, and then have them watch it before they come to the call. Uh, yes. I'm pretty sure none of them will watch it because <laughs> they don't have time. But... I bet you Wendy will. Um... Some or at least there might be can. some some watches, but yeah, I, I, your your point is taken. I I can actually also write up a little bit of what I've been talking about uh, with some examples and stuff. Here's here's kind of the space that we need to talk about. Or better yet, both. Both, yes. Jordan's back. I was just texting him. Are you coming back? <laughs> <laughs> On the side. Sorry about that. No problem. No worries. I didn't see when you dropped off, Jordan, but basically we decided that you can customize the name and the colors and maybe the icon. Okay, awesome. Uh, and the other, the other part of the answer to that, um, uh, I think what I would recommend, uh, and I haven't tried this yet, but um, they've got Mattermost, the company, uh, we'll do um, 
uh, a SaaS version of Mattermost, which I think you could theme, um, for $149 for a year for unlimited users. And I think that's what I would start with. Uh, oh, cool. Um, All I right. could set it up and it w I would charge more than that. So the thing to do is to set it up with them. Um, okay. It would be centralized on their server or the servers they control, but then it's always easy to, you know, fork it and move it someplace else. Okay, cool. So that's like the lean startup way would just be to get in touch with them directly, try to just get them. Um, I, it's not even a, um, you know, it's, it's a standard, uh, standard product offering. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Um, can you so, send me the, can you send me the link to that, Pete? Would you be willing to? Sure thing. Uh, how should I send it to you? <laughs> in, email. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, email works for, for some things. Um, it's a lifeline kind of thing, right? It's like yeah, the yeah, lowest yeah. common denominator. And I don't have a problem with email when we use it like that. The problem I have with email is when um, uh, we use it for more than a lifeline. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm frustrated by the number and length of the OGM channel stuff on that I'm getting an email because um, I just can't wade through all of it as I receive it and I have to open it up to see what it is. <laughs> yeah, it, that, that's another interesting process that because there's, there's two things is one, I'm with you, there's no way I can possibly go through everybody's thoughts and there's some really valuable things being surfaced Exactly. And so it, if there be, have blocked it. <laughs> if there'd be one or two, uh, again, that's maybe like a guild. If there's, if there's a couple people that would be willing to, who, who do enjoy going through that, there's like maybe a composting process um, where, where, you know, a couple people might volunteer to go through and just kind of summarize out the key points for people or something. Well, well just channel the conversations. If, I mean, and that's what the nice thing about CSC Agora or Mattermost kinds of stuff is that you can you can create a separate channel within the umbrella, and and that funnels it into that channel instead of it being a blast to thousands of people um, that may or may not participate directly in the conversation. Yeah, maybe thousands is too many, but I mean hundreds of people. Hey, well, th this this has been really, thank you, um, Pete, for pinging me, and thank you guys for letting me join you on this call, and uh, uh, this is so joyful, actually, to, it's, it's really, really fun to work with wonderful people. Likewise. <laughs> so so as, the, as the next couple stages for me, um, I'm going to reach out to is there anything that I need to do in that Mattermost setup to make sure that it stays interoperable with like the CSC Mattermost and some of the things that are already happening or will it just be kind of by nature? I think it will be just kind of by nature. Okay. And um, then it, feel and free then, to ping me and you know, if you've got questions or, or you see a part where you go, ah, my spidey sense makes me worry here. Okay. And then for someone who like had the Mattermost app on their phone, they'd be like, we could all have just a couple things. We could have whatever discourse is already happening through the different CSC groups and, and all that. And then we could have maybe a, a tighter, mo we, we could decide how it rolls out, but then we would want to basically, um, you could just flip over to a different account or whatever, correct? Uh, that's a really good question. And that's worth, uh, worth experimenting with a little bit. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, if it's, I assume it would, and, and I, not based on anything, I would hope that it would be like the Slack um, Discord experience where you're moving from instance to instance, but I don't know that. If it's not, that does seem a little problematic. I mean, we yeah. kind of want that interoperability. Uh, so I'm searching. that up pretty quickly yeah uh multiple i yeah. yeah right now it's it's one server on on and and it's the thing that they get requested most so it's on their roadmap to fix but they haven't fixed it yet 
Can you say more uh, about what? So you mean we're we're all just another channel? No. Um, no. Uh, so if there's a Lionsburg Mattermost and a CSC Mattermost, you get to install one on your phone. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> A, a different solution, and we didn't talk about this at all, um, um, but maybe it's worth talking about is to use discourse instead of Mattermost, but. <laughs> Boom. Well, am I, am I right, Pete, that you said Mattermost and CSC Agora are the same or not? Um, Mattermost is the software and CSC Agora is uh, the instance that CSC runs. So, uh, uh, Jordan is is proposing or wants to set up uh, instead of CSC Agora, it would be Lionsburg, you know, Agora or Lionsburg Playground or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so it would be it. They would both be running Mattermost software, but they would be different instances of it. Um, but what I'm what I'm hearing is that would you get people to it then in terms of participation if you were wanting to participate in both does that mean you if if you want to participate on both and you're on a desktop you're actually fine the desktop app you know you have a tab for each one right. on your phone mm -hmm. uh, you sign into one and you get signed out of the other one so you go to your Mattermost and it's CSC Agora and then it's like oh I think Jordan wants I, I wonder what what's happening in Lionsburg you have to log out and log in. That's not a good solution. It's not a right. good solution. And, and if, I mean, right now I'm on a tablet, which is sort of halfway between a phone and the computer, which doesn't give me the same ability to save chat, as I mentioned in chat. Um, so. Uh, it would, it would, for this, for this thing, it would be the same as the phone. The, um, I, I think the, the issue basically is um, push notifications. Um, so yeah. you in install the app on your phone and it, then it receives push notifications for, you know, messages and stuff like that. And the problem is if you have two independent services running, um, uh, CSC and Lionsburg or, you know, whatever, right. um, they're talking, they need to, there's, there's only one channel for the Mattermost app on your phone to receive, but you have two things to, that you need to listen to. So that's the thing and that they can have. Can you create, um, it is how nestable, so like if I set up a Lionsburg channel on CSC and then we, um, can you then create sub channels and sub channel, like can you, how, how nestable is it? Uh, let me let me show you real quick on, and, I have a little bit different experience with um, uh, uh, with um, Mattermost than most people because I'm subscribed to all the channels. Um, and by the way, this is the tab up here where I could just add the Lionsburg one on my desktop. Um, doesn't help me on the phone. So for nestability uh, or even separating out organizations, what we've do is we've got a convention of uh, a prefix, uh, organizational prefix. So these are all OGM channels. These are all pedagogy channels. Um, these are Kiko Lab channels, which are pretty quiet nowadays. Um, uh, so you could have, you know, uh, OGM dot truth or OGM dot wisdom or whatever. Uh, if you wanted to, or bracket OGM, bracket, bracket truth, bracket, you know, you could do that. It would get pretty old after, you know, after 10 or so. Although now that I think about it, um, another thing to, uh, to investigate is uh, the reason this is CSC Agora um, is there's uh, a concept um, in Mattermost of teams. So Agora is a team. Everybody's squished into the same team um, on CSC Agora right now. Uh, we could probably set up a, a Lionsburg team and maybe that would resolve it. Then that would probably work like um, we were just saying is let's say that Judy and I um, we could have the one the one CSC instance up. We could be part of the Lionsburg team and part of the Agora team. Yep. Um, 
yeah. collective sense commons then becomes a service provider to Lionsburg who as a for the and OGM and whatever. Yep. Um, do you want to uh, do you want to research that a little bit more and, and shoot me a recommendation and, and yep. let me know and if um, if any Michael, do you have any any thoughts yeah. on that text? I mean, text conceptually, well? I think that's that's really nice, Pete. If you're game for it, just because it opens up other possibilities too for like, yeah, you know, CTA and, and and other entities to yep, well there. Um, see, yeah, I, I think that's what would it take for CSC to be comfortable with um, doing that? I mean, that's uh, I, I, a little bit of research. I think, I think it'll be pretty straightforward. Um, the, the thing that uh, CSC was originally kind of chartered around OGM and Kiko lab, and then it's grown a little bit past that. Um, CTA was an organization where some of the members wanted to use something like Mattermost. And it's like, no, oh, CSC, Mattermost would be great. Um, uh, they've, but, but other, other parts of the organization were like, hey, we don't know this CSC organization. Who, you know, who are they? What do they stand for? Um, are, are we able to kind of participate in the stewardship of the, you know, the, the space and that kind of stuff. So that launched a little bit of discussion and especially thinking on my part about um, uh, taking the, CSC right now has a very informal stewardship. Um, it's me and, you know, folks like Michael and Stacy and Judy and, and Bill and Jerry talking about, you know, what should happen. Um, to, it would be nice to make that a little bit more formal. So somebody like CTA could have a more formal, you know, agreement with CSC. Similarly, Lionsburg, it would be so, nice to have kind so, of a, a so this more is where agreement. this is where I think the um, for for lack of a better thing for people who want to steward things without the overhead and struggle, something like a fiscal sponsorship is a very simple agreement, right? And so mm -hmm. let's say that let's say that Lionsburg. Um, and I don't know what like CTA is, if they're a nonprofit or whatever, but let's just say you, you had these nodes that wanted to be able to receive and allocate funds. They're either already a nonprofit or whatever, but uh, one way to resolve that is if Lionsburg has a set of, of values yeah. and principles and sponsors uh, CSC because it aligns with those. Yeah. And CTA, for instance, let's just say that was the same, then it's like, well, how can, it's like, well, that's, then it's like OGM, CSC, and Open Impact, and these different things are like fiscally sponsored projects or companies that are somehow affiliated by agreement. And so then maybe that opens up their ability to trust and do business with one another. And then our job is like, well, how do we govern the, the nonprofits that's functioning as the commons? And so that's then, then where we get into the governance issues. Um, and so one of the things on the roadmap over the next 33, 33 months is like, okay, as we get growing centers of nodes with agreement, how do we collectively steward, you know, the, the movement, so to speak, or the, the infrastructure commons or whatever, whatever we're calling it. Like, how do we steward the space between the sovereign self-governed nodes who are agreeing to some kind of a higher and direction? I think I think one of the answers, and I kind of, I kind of fell into it or backed into it um, intuitively. Um, it makes a lot of sense to have a, a fairly small organization uh, like CSC provide infrastructure, um, uh, and that relieved the need for OGM to have to do it. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, and it, you know, it it makes it so that there's somebody who cares a lot about making sure the service runs and that's pretty much all they care about. So then the, I think, I think uh, the, the organizations that are using that service um, need to have stewardship arrangements. So I, I, you know, there, there should be representatives from CTA and from OGM and from whoever else uses uh, 
Mattermost, the CSC Mattermost, there should be representatives in some kind of stewardship council, right? Yeah, because they're um, they're stakeholders. They're stakeholders yeah. of. So so what if we did this? What if we said, okay, to the greatest extent possible, um, as Lionsburg convenes the Meta Project, it's going to try to not do anything. <laughs> yeah. Um, and what it's going to try to do is go find and honor the superheroes who have already put a lot of work and set these up and, and invite, I guess that, that gets, that's like true modeling of that interoperability principle and going back, it's like, okay, well, let's see if, let's see what that looks like. And there could be a basic um, stewardship structure, as you're saying that, that part of each, maybe part of the MOU or agreement is the ability to, you know, send a representative, so to speak. Right. And yep. so it's like, yeah, I guess that's almost like, yeah, it's like putting somebody on the board, so to speak. It's it's creating, and then if that got yep. bigger, you'd basically create groups of stakeholders, right? So yep. like the users would be a stakeholder group, um, the the core team would be a stakeholder group, and then you you define the governance structures based on that. Yep, exactly. Um, and I, I would actually start off with uh, uh, at least one user ombudsman ombudsperson, I guess. Um, 